quantitative, like informal quantitative uh, research group, a group of people who are interested in quantitative methods and extending their own knowledge and background, uh, focused on early career investigators. If any of these things sound interesting to you, uh, please get in touch. Today's speaker is Chong Zi Di. He's professor of biostatistics at Fred Hutch and UW. He received his PhD in biostatistics from Johns Hopkins in 2009, and he's an expert in functional and longitudinal data analysis. And he's going to be talking about one of those approaches today. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you very much, Chong Zi, for doing this. Uh, thank you, uh, Brian, for the introduction. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, and uh, well, welcome, everyone. So, um, so today I'm going to uh, oh, let me first actually let me share my slides. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So, uh, can you all see my slides now? Okay. Great. Make it full screen. Um, Hmm. Uh, oh. Sorry, I think I forgot. No. Okay. No. I hope it works now. Okay. So um yeah. So today I'm just uh, um it will be as you can see it will be like a workshop on foundations of generalized estimating equations for longitudinal analysis. Um. So first, I think I was planning to. Uh, you know, at the beginning, maybe send a poll to ask everybody some quick questions to get an idea of you know your quantitative background and your familiarity with GE. But unfortunately, I don't, I don't think it's working. So, uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll <laughs> skip it. Uh, but uh, I think I assume that some of you like uh have um you know taking some maybe some courses in statistics or about statistics and uh and maybe even uh used GE in the past or some of them maybe not. Uh, and wanted to learn about GE. Uh, and then so I, I'm hoping through this to sort of a two and a half hours, like it's really not very long, but I'm hoping to give you a brief overview of what this method is and give you some examples to get an idea of how to use it if you had never used it before. Uh, as in, uh, I, I kind of also hope to, you know, um, there will be some equations in the middle, but I hopefully through them to kind of show you uh, the uh, foundations or conceptual ideas of how things work in certain ways. Uh, if you, you know, if you have difficulty with some of the technical aspects, uh, don't worry. So hopefully, in the examples, you will see more clearly uh, what those messages are. Um, so first of all, I'll just acknowledge, um, you know, a few of my uh, past professors and the collaborators. Uh, as uh, you guys probably all know, like the GE method was really invented by um, uh, Kun Yi Liang and Scott Ziegler. Um, uh, I was fortunate to, I got uh, my graduate de uh, PhD degree in Johns Hopkins. I was fortunate to work both of them. Uh, like uh, Kun Yi is my thesis advisor and I uh, I also worked with Scott and uh, Mike Griswold um, to develop like a, a, uh, some tutorial for GE, which uh, today, today's material is mostly adapted from uh, them uh, in the, the past tutorials. Uh, as in, uh, again, I'm kind of assuming that everybody um, at least have some knowledge about what linear regression is, what logistic regression is. As the, um, in statistics, we also, we also call a uh, general family models called the generalized linear models. So both linear regression and logistic regression are their specific examples. Um, so if you haven't heard of uh, generalized linear models, uh, I, I hope at least you know about linear regression and logistic regression. And also I um, kind of assume some familiarity with simple uh, matrix algebra, but uh, that's also like um, it's, it's it helps you understand the technical aspects. Um, so the, the main outline I've just uh, you know um, try to uh, break this down into like seven common questions and try to give answers to all of them. Hope, hopefully through this process, you know you can get a better idea what DE is. As in, I don't think I will have much time to talk about advanced topic. Those will be about missing data and you know time varying for various issues, and then talk a little bit about the pros and cons of GE, and uh, you know, uh, end with some discussion. So um, now let's go with, uh, to the list. So the, uh, the, those questions are basically, you know, what is GE? Where is it useful? Uh, how does it work? What software can I use? Uh, can you give me some examples? Uh, what should I read or do to get started? And what are the alternatives? 
Um, let's go through them one by one. So first, um, what, what GE, so um, I think uh, this is like, uh, I, I often hear this misused a lot. I think many people think of GE as a model, but actually it's not a model. Uh, and also it's not a computer program. What it is, it is like an estimation method uh, to fit certain models. Now the models are regression models. So you want to find a relationship between two variables. Uh, as um, the, those data are correlated or clustered, uh, as in the responses, it can, it can be continuous, it can, or can, it can be discrete. Again, I, I'll go to each of these points uh, in more details later, but just to, um, to sort of clarify, you know, that this is not really a model. You, we talk, typically call this model like a longitudinal model or like a modular regression model. Uh, and the G is really uh, one estimation matter to obtain, to help us obtain the regression coefficients and do some inference. Uh, and it is an extension of generalized linear models for cluster data. So again, as I said, uh, generalized linear models is really a very large family. Uh, did I hear something? Anybody ask a question? No, okay. Um, so yes, yeah, the generalized linear models is a family of models that contains linear regression, logistic regression, and Poisson regression. Now, typically, when we face those models, we have independent data, meaning data from different subjects are independent. Um, uh, whereas in the longitudinal data, as we all know, you know, there are some correlations. Um, now, so like there are, you know, the, the four different aspects to, to sort of understand the GEE. One is what data is that useful. We, we just talked about this longitudinal data. As in the model, it will be like a modular model. Uh, the, as in the GE will give us an, uh, some nice tools to do estimation, meaning try to get regression coefficients, but also uh, do inference, meaning try to obtain standard errors, so as we can get 95 percent confidence intervals and obtain p-values uh, to make uh, you know a conclusion to certain scientific questions. Um, now the the second aspect is where is um, GE useful? Um, now, as we um, said before, it, it's, uh, it's really useful for uh, making inference in longitudinal data, right? As in, I would also want to emphasize here is the, the inference here is we particularly talk about the so-called marginal or population average inferences. Now it's, uh, it's um, in comparison with the so-called subject specific in, um, inference, in that case, you want to use random effects model. Again, I think I'll probably go to more details later, uh, but the modular inference is talking about, you try to understand differences between maybe some sort of a subgroups of population. For example, in the, in the study, you have people, some people on treatment, some on placebo or control group, and then you want to understand difference between um, you know, uh, treatment versus control, or you want to compare between you know, younger versus older age groups. Uh, but now you're not really comparing within each person. Um, now for in longitudinal, now, so let's talk about more, a little bit more about longitudinal data and why uh, we need some special statistical tools. In longitudinal data, so um, subjects are often measured repeatedly over time. Um, now to give an example, let's see, for example, you uh, wanted to understand uh, like uh, the changes in body mass index um, in relation to maybe some lifestyle factors like diet or physical activity. Or, um, as in, so, um, so in that case, to, under, to, understand, to understand the changes, to what you want to do is in the study, recruit um, you know, a sample of subjects, and then you follow them over time. So uh, maybe at different time points, you get like those BMI measures uh, in, at each time point. So in longitudinal data, because you have these repeated measures, so it allow us to assess changes over time. Um, and, but also um, because you have, uh, if you look at the baseline, it also gives you some idea of the cohort effects. Uh, meaning at the baseline, you know, what different people's BMI, how are they correlated with their, um, you know, lifestyle factors as, as a baseline level, right? And then, but you are also able to assess changes. Um, now the uh, longitudinal data analysis needs spe special uh, statistical methods because um, you know observations from the same subject they tend to be correlated. 
Um, now let's just uh, um, give you an example. Um, this is from um, a textbook on longitudinal data from uh, Peter Deagle, um Leon Ziegler, and Hagerty. Um, so in this book, the, uh, this example is uh, uh, on CD4 counts. Um, I believe uh, among HIV, um, HIV patients. Um, so um, and so so you can see so there are lines connecting those uh, data from each point. So everybody now, so you have a uh, measures at different time points. You can you can get a line. So um, this is a sort of a typical case of longitudinal total data. Um, as in this type of a plot, you know, give us an idea of what those trajectories would look like. Uh, and by the way, this plot is typically called a spaghetti plot. Um, and the one thing you notice right away is like, you know, if you have many subjects, the plots can get really busy. So it's not easy to, um, to uh, evaluate the trend. So, um, you know, one thing you can do is maybe just pick a few randomly selected subjects. So it's easier to see for those subjects, uh, what are the, you know, uh, the changes, the trend in changes. Um, now, so that, now let's just look at you know uh, into the models or the, to see um, what what do we need to do to sort of account for those correlations. Now first let's just recall let's see for continuous response let's look at the standard linear regression model. Okay, so we have observed some data. So our model is typically seeing we um, we sort of decompose the the data into two parts: signal plus noise. And the signal would be like your maybe you have a bunch of um, predictors, so you want to use this predictor to sort of to predict some variations in the outcome. So this is your model, like whether you know, you have some you know a covariance x one through x p and the regression coefficients um, beta a uh, beta zero through beta p, as in the, the remaining as uh, called noise or is um, and in this case the typical regression case. Our we make a bunch of assumptions uh, to make it work. So, so one of the key assumptions, we assume all those noise, they, are, they follow a Gaussian distribution with a common variance. And we also assume they are independent. So um, with independence, then we are able to, you know, make some um, linear, uh, using some algebra to kind of work out a way like this square uh, to, ask, to obtain regression coefficients, to obtain the standard errors, as in, you know, you can make uh, do hypothesis testing, you can do confidence intervals. Um, but the thing is, the, the independent assumption here is really crucial. Uh, like, you know, when if some observations yi are, um, you know, correlated with yk, uh, the the problem is that um, the your standard error estimate will not be uh, correct. So because of that, you know, your p values, ninety five percent confidence intervals will also uh, be violated. Uh, now let's look at the um, longitudinal data where you know you have repeated measures on the same subject. Here, just to give a toy example, let's see you have uh, three people like Jack, Jenny, and James. Each of them, we got their like let's see BMI measurements at three different time points. You now baseline um, visit year one or year year two. Uh, okay, and then so now now everybody you can see you got three measurements. And I'm using notation like yij to the first um, index uh, is talking about the subject. The second one is talking about the visit or time. Um, okay, so everybody got the three measurements now, right? So now if you want to um, fit a model, um, so we have this yij, so we want to regress their uh, covariates. Uh, let's see uh, their um, um, you know, calorie intake. At time j, okay. So you have the covariate will be xij. So you have this, you still have this model like xi beta. So that's kind of like your regression, the, the signal part. And then you have this noise or residuals. Now the, the difference with before is that the those with noise are not um, independent anymore. They, they are typically correlated. So um, so then that, that that's kind of the uh, the, the the issue that's that's kind of caused a lot of issue. In statistical inference. Uh, now, I, and you know, I, I I assume everybody understands this. I think the reason it's, it's uh, correlated is because, of course, it, you know, it's from the same subject, right? So if a person tend to have higher BMI as a baseline, he or she also tend to have higher BMI in the follow up visits compared to other people. Um. So in the now, let's write this down. Um. 
a little bit more like the linear regression, you, know, you have yi equals xi beta plus epsilon. So if you, now we look at the covariance matrix of the residuals. Now the residuals you have epsilon one, two, and three. So um, in the typical case, we know the variance is sigma squared. So that means all the diagonal elements are sigma squared, but the covariance are zero. So all the off diagonal are zero. So your covariance matrix is actually uh, proportional to our identity matrix. Now, whereas, um, let's go to the, for the longitudinal data, however, now you have, um, sorry, uh, you have um, the model now is like yij. So you have this um, regress on xij and you have this residual epsilon ij. But now we know that for the i subject, you have a three noise, right? Or residuals. Um, now the, the question is, problem is that they are now correlated. So if you look at the variance covariance matrix, now they have the variance still sigma square, still the same, but you have some correlation here. So the covariance, let's see, as, as if you assume the correlation to be a parameter zo, now the covariance will be zo square, okay? Now if you, you can decompose this into like sigma squared times a correlation matrix. Oops, I think there's some typo here, sorry, yeah. So the correlation matrix should be one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, and then, um, so that's just for one subject, I. Okay, now let's see, we still have three subjects. Now each subject have three observations. You have three residuals, right? If you write down the whole variance covariance matrix, now how does that look like? So for the first subject, within the subject, you have this covariance matrix. It's one in the diagonal, zero, zero in the off diagonal. But for the second subject, the third subject, you got the same structure. But the first subject and second subject, they are uh, independent. That, that's kind of because they are different people, so their measurements, they are not correlated. So, so you got this part is still zero. So we typically call this like, um, block diagonal matrix. So the, so the structure overall is like intuition is like, you know, measurements uh, within subject are correlated, but across subjects, they are still independent. Um, now, if you use R to, uh, to denote this whole correlation cor uh, matrix within subject, so basically your whole um, overall covariance uh, matrix have this type of form. Now compared to the, your regular regression, in regular regression, you assume independence. So like within each subject, you still have independence. So as you can see, the main difference is here, there's correlation here in longitudinal data versus independence in the uh, regular regression. Um, now, the, so the, uh, the essence of uh, all longitudinal analysis techniques, uh, regardless of which models or methods you are using, you know, whether being of uh, GE or being like uh, mixed effects models, uh, they, they are all need to um, use some ways to take care of, of this correlation. Um, now, a natural question would be, uh, what if uh, I just ignore the correlation? I know there, there's correlation, but what if I, I just ignore the correlation, what would happen? Um, I think I'll probably, Go to a little bit more into why later, but uh, the the conclusion is that if you do that, actually you are still able to get um, a good estimate for the regression coefficients, the betas. You still got a pretty good estimate, but the, the problem comes in the inference in the standard errors. The standard errors for those coefficients are incorrect, as then because the standard errors are incorrect, so you you also will be able. To, get a wrong confidence intervals, you'll get the wrong p-values. So that also means you typically will get the wrong uh, conclusions. Now let's use this as an example. Let's see, this red dot is really your target, your true uh, value of your parameter. So what this method does, um, you know, if you kind of <laughs> choose this target a few times, you can probably find it's not centered around your true target, right? That's because you, you, you get the wrong standard errors. Um, as in, so let's talk about the validity of the method. And the, another way of evaluating the method is, is called efficiency. Efficiency means, um, am I used all the information in the data uh, to the um, most uh, possible, uh, the most efficient possible ways? 
or do, did I actually throw out some information from the data? Um, now, the, uh, the, uh, there, these are just the two examples. Let's see, in these two examples, you know, I have two methods. I try to estimate the target, um, but of course, all methods have some errors, right? But you, you notice that in both cases, the, my estimate are sort of, roughly speaking, centered around my true target, meaning I'm probably uh, shooting at the right target, that's it, doing the right job. Um, but you notice that the spread of the variation in this estimator is much smaller than this. So we, we call this method is more efficient than this. So the, the idea is saying that now, even though you, you did a good job, you still estimate the regressing coefficients efficient correctly, you are not doing things efficiently, meaning you actually throw out some information. So GE can help you pick up those additional information. So, so the essence of, you know, overall, so if you ask people ask you, why do you use GE? So two things, one is you want to get the right standard errors and the right p-values, right confidence intervals. Uh, and the second reason is you can get, you know, more efficient um, use of your data. You use the more uh, information in the data, you uh, you require less sample size to test the same hypothesis. Um, now the next part. So I think I'll probably just very pause very briefly here uh, and then see, are there any questions so far? No. Okay, I also don't see questions from the chat. Okay, so, so this part is really about, you know, really about what is longitudinal data and why we need some method like GE. The next part would be um, how does GE work? Um, now, as you can see here, there's a little bit more notation. I think I um, will, um, in the first half, I will try to maybe focus a little bit more on continuous uh, outcomes and give an example of continuous outcome. And in the um, second half, maybe uh, showing a little bit more about non-continuous or discrete outcomes. Um, now, the, the way GE works is um, you have to remember that, um, you know, it's essentially still a regression model, right? So we first, we need to specify our regression model. The regression model typically tells you about what happens to the signal, right? Your data is signal plus noise. So you wanted to, uh, to specify, you know, what are the predictors that, that can predict my outcome. So what variables I should put in my um, in my predictor, and what functional form should I use? Should I assume the outcome is a linear function of those predictors, or quadratic form, or not some sort of nonlinear functions? And then it will involve some regression parameters beta. Um, now this is, sounds a little complicated, but just for now, let's skip, ignore the the part of H. So essentially, saying like why I yij equals, it's basically this model, like yij equals xij beta plus epsilon. So uh, this is your uh, predictors uh, and this is your noise. As then um, uh, we meant, we said that the longitudinal data, you have to take care of the correlation. So, so this is part of the different from your typical regression. You have to also specify the correlation structure. So we know that yij and yik, they are correlated. So you have to, um, specify, tell the model, you know, what type of correlation structure do you have? Um, and then, so that's called a, a correlation structure. So that, let me just skip to the, um, to the next example to give you some idea. Look, give, give you some examples of the correlation structure. Um, in this case, I'm kind of assuming that um, your data, so you, you have this, look at this subject. The subject has four observations. Okay, so we can, we will look at what are the common structures, correlation structures. Now, the first one is often called um, independence. Now, this is really easy to understand. This is exactly the same as your regular regression, right? You assume all the, um, you know, observations. You have some variance in the, in the diagonal correlation is one because, you know, it's the correlation with itself, of course, it's one. But the correlation between any two observations are uh, zero. We 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 know we always tell this we know it's not zero. But in this in this, this model, if you want to skip that, uh, ignore the correlation, you can still assume that to be zero. So this is called uh, working independent structure. Now a second type of structure is called exchangeable. Now exchangeable, the, it means is that no matter what, if you look at a pair of time points, let's see, it's a time one, two, three, four whether you look at time one and time two, 
or, or time one times three or one three one four or maybe two and three. So regardless, regardless of which pair you look at, you can always assume the same correlation. The correlation is characterized by this parameter zero. Zero is some number between negative one one. So this is called exchangeable, meaning you can exchange the order of those observations, right? So, so everything is zero here. If you change the order, you still get the same correlation matrix. Um, now the next one is called um, one dependent correlation. Um, now this, the meaning of this is saying that uh, now I'm looking at the time, if I look at the correlation between two observations, it depends on the gap, the time gap between them. If the time gap is one, so in this case, I'm looking at one, is it one versus two or versus two versus three or three versus four. So I'm assuming you have some correlation and call it the one. But anything above one, you know, if the gap is more than one, I'm assuming the correlation becomes zero. So this is called a one dependent. Uh, one refers to the fact that the gap is, is now zero only for a time gap of one. Now you can also define a two dependent, right? So if the gap, if the time gap is one, you have the correlation zero one, but if the time gap is two, now you're looking at time one versus three or two versus four. Now those you have a kind of a, assume it's another uh, parameter zero two, but anything above two, you still assume it's zero. Um, now, another one that is very common is called autoregressive uh, correlation. This, I would argue, is probably um, more realistically more reasonable. Um, it's saying that um, you, has, you have the, co the correlation actually become smaller as your time gap become larger. So meaning if, you, if the time gap is one, it's zero, but if the time gap is two, it's zero squared. Now, because zero is a number, the absolute value is smaller than one. So zero squared actually is smaller than zero. So you got, you got smaller correlation. So, so that effectively what that means is if you compare, you know, correlation between time one and three, that should be smaller than the correlation between one and two. Um, and one and four is even smaller. So that's kind of autoregressive correlation. Now the last one, uh, we often call it unstructured correlation. Now, unstructured, that means I don't assume any sort of structure. You know, in this case, if I'm, it's a four by four correlation matrix. So everything here is unknown. I assume every uh, number here can be different from the other one. So um, now, now this model is uh, typically the most flexible, um, but okay, it's, it's also the most unstable because you, you need to estimate a, a large number of parameters. Right? In other structures, you sometimes often, often need only one parameter or two parameters. Whereas here, you need to estimate a large number of parameters. Um, so that's kind of typically become more challenging and also become uh, more unstable. So those are the four uh, you know, typical uh, coders and structures we often use. Now let's just uh, um, go back to the model a little bit. Uh, I think, okay, go, go back, go to this model. Okay, so now, as I said, you know, we, when we specify the model, the two steps, the first step is you specify this mean regression, right? Just like your regular regression. The only difference, you know, your input is like XIJ and YIJ, the others longitudinal data, right? And then you also need to specify the um, asso association or the correlation structure, you know, um, you maybe, let's see, in continuous data, you assume the variance of sigma square, you assume a correlation structure. You assume, let's see, one of those, you know, maybe working independence or exchangeable or autoregressive or unstructured, right? But the, the question is, you know, typically before you face the data, you probably don't have a very good idea of what's, which correlation structure is correct, which is incorrect. Um, and then the, the GE, I think, so, um, makes, it's really a smart way uh, to, to see that, you know, I you probably don't have a lot of information. And also, I don't want the method to depend too much on your assumption of the correlation. So it's sort of saying that I ask you to specify a so-called working correlation. Now, working correlation, you can think of that as like a, an assumption. So you just assume something. It may be right. It may not be right. Okay, but the, as the essence is like the GE is working in a way so that even if your assumption that the working correlation structure is incorrect, 
you're still able to get the right regressing coefficients, you get the right standard errors, so you will be able to make the right inference. Um, I, I think I for this part, I will probably um, talk more about this in the second half of the workshop. Um, maybe just, just maybe to briefly summarize a little bit. So, so you, you specify a working correlation structure, and then you will be able to um, fit a GE. Now, now GE is the estimation method, it's implemented in pretty much all major statistical softwares. Uh, and then, um, and then you, uh, and, uh, and also talk a little bit about the variance, the standard error or variance estimator. Now, um, this is, uh, again, a lot of notations, it seems really complicated, uh, but I've just, uh, you know, summarized this very briefly. So we, uh, we the GE gave us, first gave you some way to estimate this regression coefficient beta hat, okay? But then we also want to get the standard errors, right? So in the Leon Ziegler's um, paper, the, in, in actually in all pretty much all most of the statistical papers, we also need to tell you what would be the asymptotical distribution, meaning that if my sample size is large enough, what would it be the standard error for beta hat? Now they derive a formula that looks like this. Now the, the, it looks like um, I both I zero and R one are some matrix. Now this is this often called a sandwich variance estimator. The reason it's called a sandwich, you can see it's basically the product of the three matrix. Um, so the, the, two, the, the, the two matrix in the two sides, they are exactly the same. The one in the middle is different. So you sort of view this as a sandwich where there's kind of a two pieces of bread on the two sides that's meat in the middle. So that's why it's called a sandwich variance estimator. Uh, but I think I, the, 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 I, what I want to tell is that, you know, in a lot of uh, statistical packages, um, so you sometimes you get two versions of standard errors. The one version is the so-called um, um, model-based uh, standard errors. Um, now the model-based standard errors uh, need the assumption that you guessed the right working correlation. So that's what really one important point to, to keep in mind. Uh, whereas if you use the, you, another estimator, it's sometimes called sandwich variance, sandwich estimator or empirical estimator or robust variance estimator. It could be any of those three names. Um, if you use that, uh, the, the beauty is that your standard error will not depend on your assumption. Meaning even if you get the wrong correlation, you still will be able to get the right standard errors and making the right inference. Um, now um, you may ask, you know, if that's the case, then does it still matter which working correlations do you use, right? Which assumptions do you make? Um, now, actually, it matters uh, only in the terms of efficiency, in the sense that um, if you if your guess of the working correlation is really close to the true correlation structure, then you get more efficiency, meaning you get to use more information in the data. You get to get smaller standard errors, uh, and then um, uh, you, it's easier to get the significance. Whereas if your guess was totally wrong, you still be able to get the right standard errors and p-values, but probably not as efficient. So your power will be, will be lower. So um, with that, yeah, so I think this is, like, as I said, so this is like model, so you have model-based um, estimator for the variance, you have the robust empirical or sandwich estimator as well. So I think, that is probably, um, um, you know, I, I know, you know, for some of you, if you haven't heard of GE before, it might be a little bit overwhelming, but I think now let's just go to an example. So hopefully um, you can get, get a better idea of how that works. So uh, any um, questions so far? No, okay, don't see questions. Okay, so let's go to an example. Uh, now this example um, is for continuous response. It's a, um, from a textbook, um, analysis of longitudinal data. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, the data is looking, it's actually a phase to be uh, randomized trials, clinic uh, comparing two medications um, uh, to reduce uh, schizophrenia uh, symptoms. So um, the design is uh, like pre-post design. Um, so 
you recruit people um, in the study, randomize them into uh, different arms, as in for everybody, so you, you measure their response. They're, they're in, in this case, the measurements are taken at a few time points. Uh, there's a pre-intervention um, with, with its baseline and also post-intervention, they're measured at week one, two, four, six, and eight. Okay, and then the outcome is um, a score called uh, enhanced score. It's positive and negative syndrome skill. Um, for this score, actually lower is better, okay? So that's, um, here's, um, now I, I think, um, so let's first pause the data and see uh, how things look like, right? So because we have two different medications, the two groups, so um, we can plot them um, to, and separate them by uh, treatment groups. Uh, for the first group, so we plot their trajectories, each line corresponds to one subject, uh, and the y-axis is their um, pen score, and then the x-axis is the time, the week at zero, one, two, four, six, and eight, right? So for everybody, you just connect the dots to make a line to indicate each person's trajectories, right? So now we, you probably, at this point, you probably, and also I added like, um, uh, like so-called, so like the average curve here, uh, but in the dashed line. So you can probably make some observations. Um, so one thing is, are there, you know, are there any sort of um, indication of a correlation? Now correlation typically means if a person starts higher, does he or she tend to stay higher? Uh, or if it starts lower, do they tend to start, stay lower uh, throughout the study? Now, if you, if you look at the uh, multiple examples, you can see roughly speaking, that's probably the case, right? You know, like taking this, uh, curve as example, it starts kind of generally higher. Uh, it's actually the highest to start with, but it, it goes a little bit lower, but it still, you know, uh, remain relatively higher across if you compare to other subjects, right? So this one, it starts lower, it also generally remains lower. So on the, um, on the right hand side, uh, another arm, you observe the similar phenomenon, right? So that means this seems to be pretty, um, strong obvious evidence of within subject correlation. That probably also means that you know your if you run a regular regression, you you know have some issues. Um, now the next is um, so so let's maybe think about to, to build some statistical model, right? So first, you know, I did one thing which is um, now, because now the time points are zero, one, two, four, six, and eight. Right? So one thing that you can really help you explore, you know, what the type of trajectories is to simply uh, calculate uh, mean, right, or average at each time point, right? So that's exactly what we did here. So for each group, uh, for the this halo group and the risk uh, risk group, I will just simply calculate the mean uh, at baseline. You know, I plot the dot here at one week, two week four weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks, right? So this is a really like the average trajectories of their scores with, in this group. And then the blue lines are the uh, your average trajectories for another group, right? Now, so you, so you probably made some observations, you know, looks like, you know, in both arms, the score tend to get lower, which means, um, remember, lower is, uh, is, uh, is better. So we, we get kind of, a, uh, they got like the treatment is the medication is working. Uh, okay, actually a question asked is time zero prior to basement uh, treatment or not? Um, yeah, I think it is prior to treatment. Yeah, it is. Uh, that, that's exactly right. It is a baseline is prior to treatment. Yeah. And you also notice that, um, you know, the, the maybe, um, you know, the, the decline, does that seem to be a linear relationship? Um, well, probably not exactly, right? I mean, roughly you can see maybe for the blue line, maybe closer to a linear, but you can see maybe the slope, it tends to go down a little bit faster at the beginning and then slope becomes smaller. Uh, for this red line, it's more obvious, right? So this is pretty, the slope is pretty steep at the beginning as then becomes uh, smaller as time went on. 
Um, so now the so next you will think about you know what type of a model you want to build. So the first step is build a mean model, meaning you, you want to build uh, to have a model of how the response um, you know um, is uh, correspond to the covariance. Now let's just consider a few uh, examples. Now one of the examples is the so-called saturated model. Now because you have like uh, to by about I think six time points. So you have a baseline, you have week one, two, four, six, and eight, right? So you have six time points. So, you know, if you really wanted to model this trend most flexibly, right? So you would, you know, create some dummy variable. You would allow the slope to change at each time point, okay? So that's the most flexible model. So now if you write out the statistical model, you would create some dummy variables uh, for each of the time point. That's week one dummy variable would be, uh, equals one if it's uh, for week one. Uh, if it's uh, not week one, then the, the variable is zero. Similarly, um, for W1 up to W8, okay? Now you can specify a model where your score can be predicted first using all those weak, um, you know, weak uh, time uh, dummy variables, right? So it's, tell, it's allow you to see that, you know, as the time went on, the score was changed over time. So this is basically the, the trajectory over time. But then you also know that you have two treatment options, you know, two different medications. So I'm uh, coding that treatment variable to be one if it is for this risk um, medication, and I'm coding this as a zero is for this halo medication, okay? So um, now you know that the two treatments probably have different effects. Now the way we model that, we all also add a interaction between the treatment. So, so basically, I'm, uh, oh, another way to think about this is seeing that if the treatment is zero, meaning for this halo out like a medication, this is their trajectories, you know, beta one, this beta one up to beta five. But for the other treatment groups, the trajectory, um, you know, actually would be, um, the, the, the slope might, might be changed. So you have this allow this beta seven to be the change of, of the slope uh, at week one, and similarly week two, four, six, and eight, okay? So now this model, I think, um, so it's really, really a mathematical uh, representation of the saying that you allow this change to be really flexible. You allow the slope to change, to change over time in both groups. And in, in this case, now, if you, your scientific question is to ask about what are the differences in between treatment, right? So you are uh, you are mostly interested actually in these parameters, like these parameters are uh, uh, interaction parameters. Um, now, of course, now some of you might say, well, that model seems maybe uh, uh, pretty complicated. How about I try some simpler models? Now, now the, the simplest model is probably let's consider a simple linear regression, uh, like linear, uh, maybe assuming a linear relationship. Okay, so in that case, so you will have your outcome, you model that as a linear function of the weak. In this case, weak is a continuous variable, like taking values 0, 1, 2, 4, 8. Uh, for six eight, um, so so it's basically a linear. So you're assuming the trajectory is a linear function of weight, okay? And then you are seeing that um, for the treatment um, for people who receive this treatment, now their uh, baseline might be different, uh, you know, right from the uh, the uh, reference group, and also the slope might also be different from the reference group. So beta two really tells you the change uh, in baseline. And beta three is the interaction between weak and the treatment. It tells you um, the difference in slope between the two treatment groups, okay? Now this model is a little bit simpler, right? But then at the same time, it makes a stronger assumptions. It's basically assuming that the relationship is a like, more like linear relationship. Uh, now you can also consider maybe um, somewhere in the middle, like you know some alternative relationship. Let's see some, um, plateau model. Uh, now, you, for example, you kind of maybe you, you look at the data, and then you make the observation that it looks like there are some sort of meaningful declines um, before week four. Let's see. And then after week four, it seems like it's relatively flat, right? So you make this observation. So you probably would um, specify a plateau model where you know you let this variable to be seen that if it's less than week four. It's exactly the same as a week, and if it's a, a larger than week four, I'm just you know uh, make this variable just equal to week four. So in that case, 
it is saying that there's no changes after week four. Now, similarly uh, speaking, so you would put this variable time variable in the model, you will have this interaction. And again, this interaction is what you are most interested in. Um, now, may some some people might think, well, maybe um, maybe I'm thinking about a quadratic model to allow a quadratic relationship. You can do that too. In that case, you would see that you using quadratic form uh, of a week. You have the linear form and you have the week square to indicate a quadratic relationship, right? For both the reference group and the treatment group. Um, so, so that means you assume a quadratic relationship in both cases. Now there are, of course, there are other options too. You can maybe assume a cubic relationship. You can assume exponential relationship or, you know, maybe square root of, or whatever else you think that might be reasonable from your um, scientific hypothesis. You may also uh, do like uh, using splines to allow some more flexible relationships. Um, but I think the, the point is, I think um, I'm just illustrating uh, using these examples to tell you that, you know, the first step of building uh, like, you know, analyze the longitudinal model using GEE is actually uh, before fitting the model, you wanted to explore, you know, the trajectories, how does the relationship look like? So, and when you are doing this step, it's perfectly fine to skip, to ignore the correlation, just using your standard, let's see, um, using your standard uh, uh, linear regression models. Uh, and then um, you, you can explore different, you know, whether it be saturated models, but least was it linear or um, plateau or quadratic. Um, and then, so let's see, um, let's see how that works. Uh, now, in, I actually, um, in the next few slides, I'm just showing the, the model fading. If you just simply, as I said, if you, but for now, just uh, ignore the correlation, okay? And then just, uh, um, well, I think I see another question saying, when do we decide on these assumptions a priori or after looking at the data? Um, I think a, a starting point would be like, you know, um, we would, would be, you know, if you have some sort of scientific knowledge or hypothesis uh, about what the relationship would look like. If you have those, you, I think that would be a good starting point. Um, but uh, then uh, if you don't have any, maybe linear model is can be a good starting point. As then I would say that you always uh, then wanted to do some exploration like this to make sure that, you know, I think you, you typically can compare your observed uh, means versus model fitted means to, to get some sense of how the goodness of the fit uh, and then to sort of assess the, uh, if the assumptions are reasonable or not. So let's go through this exercise. Um, so using these regular list of squares fitting on this model, okay? So um, now this model, I think, uh, oh, this is just the same as a saturated model. That's basically saying it's exactly the same as fitting uh, the, uh, you know, averages at each time point, okay? So that's, um, that's nothing special about this. So, so this model, I, as we said, it's really flexible. So if you don't mind the model being a little bit complicated, the model is just perfect. There's no issue with this model. Now let's look at another one. The second model, let's see, you look at uh, assuming a linear relationship, okay? And then if you face a model, and then you plot the predicted trajectories uh, for these two groups. Now, what you would find is that, again, those, uh, those trajectories are the observed means, okay? But the, the lines, the red lines here, is the model predicted trajectory. Now, because you are assuming this linear relationship, so it's really trying to do seeing that among all the possible lines, which one is the best fit to my data, right? So you get this line. Um, so you can see, well, it's, it captures the rough, the rough trend, meaning it's kind of a decreasing relationship, so declining, right? It captures this rough trend, but it's not very good, right? It's assuming the slope is constant, but in reality, the slope was deeper in the beginning as then it's kind of become flattens later on. So it did not capture this sort of curvature here. Um, and then for the blue, uh, the other group, you know, you made similar observation. Okay, again, you captured rough trend, but you know, not, but still uh, maybe oversimplifies. Now let's see, the, go to the next model. Now, what if you uh, kind of use a plateau model? Uh, let's see, you, uh, Look at assuming there's a change of slope at week four. Okay, so in this case, 
again, I'm use these lines, the red lines and the blue uh, this lines indicating the model predicted trajectory. So you can see is compared to the simple relationship, it seemed to do a little bit better, right? So um, because you know it sort of captures the you know the trend of the, the slope being more steep at the beginning and then more flat uh, towards the end. And the blue line, the blue line is probably uh, is even a little bit better. So, so now you you, you know that this model it is it, not perfect, uh, but seems to be um, seems to to doing better than the previous one. Uh, and then I I don't think I uh, I did not include the example for the um, you know quadratic. I think quadratic is maybe slightly better than this. Uh, but I think I I stop here. So I just you know. Um, to make one point is, you know, as probably all of you have heard that um, when we run statistical analysis, we often fit models, but there's a famous saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So if whichever model we choose, as uh, it almost will never be perfect. So um, it will, there will be always be some issues. We need to make some compromise. The compromise oftentimes is like your um, the so-called um, complexity or parsimoniousness of the model versus the, um, I guess, model fading in some sense, meaning that you, you if your model become too complicated, it's not easy to interpret, it's not easy to understand, you run into sort of unstable fading problems. Uh, but if it's too easy, it might be simplest, too simplistic. So sometimes you want to sort of strike a balance somewhere in the middle where it's probably not capture all the details in the trend, but still capture roughly the trend uh, and you know not uh, too uh, simplistic. So, so in this case, you know, um, I I think everybody might have uh, his or her, or her own opinion, but um, I think if uh, I would say you know maybe this plateau model is sort of like um, reasonable medium in the middle, whereas you know you have two parameters um, sort of a uh, you, you have the parameter, uh, you know, the parameter telling you the, the slope uh, before week four. And it also sort of capture the, the trend that sort of the effect is uh, more constant after week four. Uh, and then, so it's really simple. You have just one parameter, which is really interpretable, but still is, it fits the data better than the simple regression models. Uh, okay, so that's, mm, that's the first part. So it fits the mean model. Now the next part uh, will be Let's go to the correlation of the association part, right? So to explore this, now, as we said before, in GE, you sort of have to specify a working correlation. I mean, it doesn't have to be correct. It doesn't to be, have to be perfect, uh, but you have to um, assume some, some sort of structure. Uh, as we said that, um, how good of your assumption or your structure, uh, it's really depending on your, like, um, how small, how precise your estimate are or how, the, the power of your uh, your your estimate. Um, so so in that in that sense, you you always always be get a, a valid estimate no, no matter what. So but uh, still, typically before fitting the data, I typically would recommend you know explore the data a little bit to sort of try to get some sense of what the correlation structure looks like. Now in this case, because we have already fitted a mean structure, okay. Now so you you can uh, take your um, fitted model and as calculate the residuals, meaning you take the observed data, it subjects the predicted values for, for at each time point, okay? And then once you get the residuals, now you are able to look at the variance covariance matrix. Now you can plot them, the pairwise scatter plots, the different time points, and then you can estimate, you know, um, the calculate the variance covariance matrix. Okay, now if you look at the, the scatter plot, now this one will be the correlation between residues between week zero and week one, right? This is between week zero and week two, and this is between week six and week eight. Now, what you observe is now obviously you all typically always have this kind of a positive correlation. That's not surprising, right? So the, again, the observation from the same subject tend to be co uh, positively correlated. Now, if you look at your um, um, co uh, correlation matrix, to verify this observation, right? So you have this off diagonal terms. They are all positive. They're all somewhere between zero and one. Okay, so so now, so you know that maybe working independence is not a very good choice. There should be some uh, sort of medium uh, to high amount of um, within subject correlation. 
uh, now you may also sort of observe, um, look at the, so what structure does this look like? Remember, we have a few structures like uh, exchangeable is saying everything, all the correlations are roughly the same. Now if you look at this, um, it looks like there are some variations, right? The smallest maybe somewhere around 0.4, where the highest could be as high as 0.99. So it looks like maybe exchangeable is probably okay, but not maybe not the best. As in, maybe you are thinking about maybe is there autoregressive correlation maybe more reasonable? Now, autoregressive is saying that you are looking at the gap between the time points, right? The gap one will be along this line, and the gap two will be along this line, and gap three, and gap four. So, uh, gap, gap four is here, and gap five. So, do, do you see that the correlation seem to decrease um, with the time gap between those variables? I think there appear to be some decline, right? So, so now at this point, you probably are thinking, well, maybe in, I mean, no independence is not good. Exchangeable is probably not perfect, but probably still something that you can try. And also regressive probably makes even more sense. Um, and um, there's um, something you can also sort of uh, estimate the so-called autocorrelation function. Um, now this is uh, um, this is the auto correlation. I might just uh, simply say that you kind of assume the correlation depending only on the gap between the time points, right? Uh, as in um, in R, that's very uh, simple code that you can do to generate this auto correlation function. It's mainly help us try to figure out you know if something like auto regressive uh, is like a good correlation structure. So the the thing to look for is like. What do you get from this uh, um, autocorrelation function? Is it on the x-axis? Is it is it time gap or lag? Uh, so how many weeks um, between two observations? And the y-axis is the correlation. If you see obvious decline, uh, that and if the decline is um, roughly speaking linear decline, I'm oh, sorry, not that maybe like some exponential type of decline. That that's kind of typically indicate um, um, autoregressive uh, structure. So, but you don't really you don't really have to do this. I think if you do something like this, uh, you know, look at the figures. If you look at the covariance correlation matrix, you probably have a like a, a rough idea of what correlation matrix might be reasonable. Okay, so now so you get a good idea. You you already know phase the mean model, right? So um you explore some model, you face the mean model. Now let's explore the the correlation structure. So now it's time to put things together and really run uh, the GE to getting your um, estimates. Um, now, so in this example here, so I would choose the plateau model for the mean model part. And I'll choose um, the, um, for the first working model, I would still use the working independent. No, as I, you know, I said, it's probably not a good idea, but we, let's still give it a try and see what happens. Um, now, if you face a model, uh, now the you can first again you still plot uh, the predicted mean trajectories for each treatment group. Okay, uh, uh, those lines. So you probably notice those lines are pretty similar to the ones you got before. Like by uh, ignoring the the correlation, running your typical linear regression, uh, they are pretty similar. I think that's that's the reason is that. Um, if for continuous response, if you if you ignore the correlation, actually you still get the right coefficients, so you still get a reasonable fit for the uh, trajectory. Uh, that's kind of not surprising. Uh, as in, um, as oh by the way, and the, on the right hand side, I put like the SAS code and R code as well. In, in um, for I think for both cases, so you you will have some parts to specify your mean model. In SAS, it's this part. In R, you have to specify your formula will be your plateau variable and treatment. Uh, in R, if you are using this um, um, this symbol, so it uh, it means in the model you have both the main effects as well as interactions. So you specify the the mean model, okay? And then you also want to specify the the like the um, the so called um, you know which observations belong to the same subject. So that's typically indicated by this subject variable. So tell you which observations are repeated methods from the same subject. In R would be like ID, this ID variable. And you also need to specify the working correlation. In SAS, it's like a type is in independent. 
in our uh, the libraries. Uh, um, I think I'm using GE Path library. So the code and the structure uh, you have to specify over here. So, oh, uh, I see a question saying, in for R, how or when you de define the plateau uh, object? Okay, so I think the um when you de define the plateau um variable is actually when you are doing running the mean model. When you are running the mean model, um, so we know that the weak variable is so zero, one, two, four, six, eight. That's not exactly what we want. Uh, what we want because what we want is kind of we assume a change between zero. So with zero, one, two, four. That's still what we want. But after week four, we want to make everything to be to 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 like uh, to become week four. So stays at four. So so there's no changes. So you define this plateau variable. It's really a transformation of the original weak variable. Okay, so, so you define this variable uh, before you fit in the data, obviously. Okay, so yeah. And then, so if, let's see, if you wanted to uh, consider a different correlation structure, so then all you need is in the code is, you know, you still have the same uh, mean model and still, we, um, specify the repeated measures to a subject, but then now you change the type to exchangeable. In R, similarly, you change the type to exchangeable. Uh, now, with this model, because the, for exchangeable model, it's kind of assuming the correlation between any two observations for the same subject is the same, right? So it has this additional parameter, which is the correlation between different observations within subject. So you have this additional alpha parameter. So it gives you uh, an estimate of alpha. In this case, it tells you alpha is 0 0.63. So it's relatively called kind of medium to high um, sort of correlation between subjects. Now the next, I'm also giving you an example of uh, if you want to fit autoregressive, uh, in this I said AR1, that means first order autoregressive model. Um, now the, the, again, the only thing you need to change in the code would be change the type, the working correlation, uh, to be this AR type, okay? And in that case, you also get a uh, um, parameter alpha. Alpha is like really the correlation between the so-called lag one. That means, you know, if it's a two time points, if their um, time lag is one week, what will the correlation be? It's, in this case, it will be 0.76. So it's estimated a higher correlation compared to the, um, uh, to the um, exchangeable structure. But then it assumes the correlation would decrease as your lag as your lag uh, increases. Meaning, for one week is 0.74, but if the time gap is two weeks, it is the correlation become 0.57. And now it become even smaller as the gap become bigger, right? So, so so basically, the main difference between these two is like this one assume all the correlation are the same. This one is saying that you know, it is uh, higher for like one and become lower for like two and three and etc. To allow the correlation to to decrease over time. Uh, sorry. Uh, let me. Uh, I think I got. Okay. Now, there's some people might be saying, uh, "Well, I also know that this there's another structure called unstructured, which seems to be mostly flexible. It does not sort of assume any of those kind of exchangeable or autoregressive structure." So how about we also run that? I mean, that one, I um, if your number of uh, visits or repeated measurements is relatively smaller, let's see, two, three, four, um, you know, I think it's probably fine to run as structured. But if the, in this case, we have, I think, uh, two, three, four, we have six observations within each subject. In this case, uh, you can run into problems. That, actually, that's exactly what happened for this data set. You know, if you run this, um, the program it will give you a warning. I think the reason is part. There are two reasons. One reason is that um, there are just simply too many correlation parameters. Like the, the variance covariance, the correlation matrix is really big, so you have many uh, metrics. Uh, you have many parameters to to estimate. And the second one um, is some of the correlations are close to one. So if you look at the uh, correlation matrix uh, of the original data, actually. There are a few elements, especially after week four. This is the four, six, and eight, I believe. So the correlation, as you can see, are really close to one. So in that case, um, sometimes you can run into 
and stability in estimation. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I see some questions about um, is this right for plateau calculation? Yes, that's exactly right. Um, and another question asking about interpretation. So can you interpret the plateau effects as initial efficacy that was maintained at later follow-ups? Yeah, I, I think that's that's absolutely right, yeah. Okay, so, so now, so at this step, so we, you know, we, assume the few possible working coalition structures. We run the models uh, and then we get, we're able to get the model running okay, except the unstructured model, right? So now let's look at the output and then see what we can uh, we can get from these models. So I think one thing, as I said before, is you, um, you sometimes you got two versions of standard errors. So one version is called a sandwich or robust or empirical uh, variance or standard errors. Another version is called a model-based standard errors. So in this in this table, I um, put all the model outputs for um, the model estimates, intercept, uh, the main effect for the uh, the time variable, the plateau and treatment and the, um, plateau and treatment interaction. Remember, this interaction is really uh, what we are most interested in. Really, it's a, a difference um, in changes uh, between two groups, right? So that's why it's an interaction, not many facts. Um, as in, so, so, this, so this part gives us the main estimate for uh, the regression coefficients from a model with independent working correlation, with exchangeable working correlation, and then with autoregressive working correlation, okay? So you fit G three times, each time with different working correlation. You get three sets of estimates. You have regression coefficients, those parts are the standard errors. And then you got also got the word statistics. And I I don't have time, uh, I don't have um, space for p-values, but you also get p-values typically. So if this word statistics is like the absolute value is larger than 1.96, that means um, it's a statistically significant. I'm using a, a star here to, to indicate the significance. Um so so you can see, so first maybe let's uh, let's just uh, compare the regression coefficient from three model fitting, okay? So you want just three different times, each time with a different working correlation. So you can see the regression coefficients, they are not exactly the same, but they are pretty close, roughly speaking, right? If you, especially if you consider the standard error is roughly 0. 0.9, so they are really close. So that's reassuring, right? So that's kind of a, that's a property of what we call uh, robustness property of GE, meaning, um, you, you sort of have to specify some working correlation, but your model fitting does not depend too um, closely on those assumptions. So no matter what we, you do, you still get a good estimate. Um, uh, as in the, look at the standard errors. So notice that working independence and exchangeable, uh, you get maybe similar, um, oh, actually oh, all three are somewhat similar, but the autoregressive give you slightly smaller standard errors. Uh, for this variable. But then uh, it's not always, uh, the standard error for this one is not always smaller for all the um, effects. If you look at this main effect, for example, actually the uh, autoregressive give you higher standard errors. Okay, so I just want to see the, um, you know, the, the direction of the, uh, you know, uh, comparing the standard errors, it could be larger, it could be smaller. Uh, it doesn't have to be always smaller. And then, um, but in this particular case, because this is really the interactions what we are mostly interested in, actually you got smaller standard errors for the autoregressive, meaning this model actually is probably the most efficient among all of them. So meaning it gives you, it's the most precise right? because the um, the correlation, the, the autoregressive correlation is the closest to the true correlation. So that's, that's why you are able to use the most information from the data. Now the next slide I want to, to show you um, what if you um, choose the model-based standard errors. Um, if you choose model-based standard errors, again, I'm showing you all different, three different models and add, uh, regression coefficients, standard errors, and the world statistics. Now you notice, if especially let's focus on standard errors, you notice them, that um, they are, 
somewhat different, right? So like, especially for the independence of the AR, like the standard is 1.0 or 4 is larger than before, where it's exchangeable. This one's uh, smaller than before. Uh, uh, but it's kind of, a, um, it's different. And then it, it also potentially give you different significance result. In fact, all the exchangeable, uh, you will only conclude significance from the exchangeable model. In your working independence or working autoregressive, you will conclude it's not significant. Um, but uh, I think in the next part, I just maybe put those um, two versions of standard error in the same table. So it's easier to see. Again, let's focus on the interaction. Okay, so, oh yeah, I think we, we, we've seen it before. I just put them on the same page. Again, you can, you, you realize the standard errors are different. And also another thing to note is that it's the robust errors, uh, robust standard errors we miss similar whichever um, model you're feeding, right? Whereas if you choose model-based standard errors, it actually varies quite a bit between different models. Um, I think in this case, so I think one um, message um, it's, that's really important is like, um, it's always using the empirical sandwich or robust estimator. So the model-based estimators, they are not that robust in the sense that they depending on your, uh, working correlation. So this number is only correct if the true correlation is exchangeable, okay? But if the true, since we look at the data, it doesn't look like it's the case, then this number probably will be wrong. Now, similarly, this one is only correct if the true correlation is independent, okay? So I think, so the take home message is like, uh, be, when whichever uh, package, statistical package you use, uh, try to be careful, when you look at standard errors, try to be careful, if they give you two versions, I always pick this robust sideways or variance uh, or uh, empirical estimators. Um, okay, so now at this point, we are almost done with um, this analysis, right? So you first, you know, we, for the mean structure, so we said, you know, even though uh, it's probably not a perfect model, but it seems like a reasonable compromise, a reasonable uh, sort of medium is that, the, the trajectory, generally speaking, the, the pass score appears to decrease um, with time and then stabilize um, or plateau around week four. Um, and then sometimes, uh, you know, um, you may have defined like a treatment effects being look at the beginning and the end of the trial, like really pre-treatment, that's baseline week zero or post-treatment week eight, right? You really, maybe all want to only focus on the difference bet uh, between those uh, these two time points. In that case, now uh, you can go to your model, try to predict your uh, outcome at week eight and week zero. Uh, you can do this for both groups. As in just uh, doing some um, a quick algebra, you will be able to find that actually um, the that effect in the plateau model is four times beta three. Um, now the reason is, Four times beta three is it kind of assuming that um, the the changes plateau after week six. So really, the maximum change is, is at week six, right? So so based on this model, you can the post as four weeks and eight weeks is exactly the same. That's a, what the model assumes. Uh, as in, it's like four is the number of weeks um, in the time gap between zero and four weeks, and the beta is like the effect uh, the effect of a change per week. So that's why the treatment effects here uh, really is uh, four times beta three. Uh, and if you go to each of your models that, that you fit, so you will be able to get the estimate uh, for these effects. And you get their standard errors, you get their 95% confidence intervals, and you'll be able to get p-values. Now I summarize the results here. So as you can see, um, so actually the, the coefficients, there are some slight difference, but you know, really similar overall, especially considering how large the standard error is, right? And if you calculate your 95% confidence intervals, um, again, you got like pretty similar results overall. And this confidence interval does not contain zero. Um, that's, uh, that also means that it's, all of them are statistically significant. Okay, so, so I think the, so the good thing is, so now so we are ready to make conclusions. So, so now, so you know that regardless, now you see, uh, you know, you maybe, you know, if I give three different people, 
to analyze this data. They may choose different working coalition structure, but the good thing is they got this roughly uh, very similar uh, estimates of the slope, right, of the treatment effects. They give you the same conclusions. That, that's, that's very good. And But you may also ask, in that, if that's a good case, is, does that still matter, um, you know, which colors do you use? Uh, now, it matters only uh, when you may not have enough sample size. So the difference, I think the most meaningful difference come from the standard error. Uh, look at it here. So the standard error for the exchangeable and independence are 3.56, whereas the autoregressive give you a standard error point 3.45. It's smaller than these two, right? So that meaning you got more precise estimator if your guess of this working correlation is more reasonable, it's closer to the, to the true correlation. Now in, in, in this example, it does not, um, it makes some slight difference, but um, you know, it does not really change your conclusion overall, but, right? but some, in, sometimes if your sample size are smaller, sometimes it can uh, make a difference between significance and insignificance. Okay, um, and then um, the treatment, you know, we, we realized that the, um, the average uh, score, so the overall conclusion was like the average pass score, you know, if you compare um, basement versus uh, eight weeks, um, the scores were about seven units lower, um, you know, for uh, the patients in, in, um, in this risk, uh, risk group compared to the halo group. And the treatment effects are consistently estimated from different correlation models, which is really uh, reassuring. Okay, and then uh, I'll just, uh, I, I don't think I have, uh, I didn't put the results here, but if you put what happens if you um, ignore the correlation, if you just fit a standard simple regression, what you get, you actually will get the same uh, estimated versus here, still roughly, you know, seven units lower in scores, but your standard, standard errors will be way off. Maybe you got something like a five or a two, um, but typically it will be, um, will be, the standard error will be wrong. And as a result, your p-values will be wrong. You probably will get wrong conclusions. Um, I think that's the end of this example. So um, I I think, um, you know, at this point, um, any, um, I think there were some questions already from the chat about this example. So any, um, any additional questions? Okay, I don't see any. So uh, I think I, I'll, let me just uh, um, summarize something very briefly uh, and then we can take a break. Uh, so let me see if I can find that slide. Okay, so yeah, I think this is, a, um, I, I want to emphasize this because I feel like this is really important uh, and uh, uh, you know, um, in some of the projects, uh, I you know work with uh, um, uh, non-statisticians or even statisticians who are not necessarily familiar with uh, longitudinal analysis or GEE. I think uh, one mistake I of often see people um, make is just uh, uh, not explore doing exploratory data uh, enough and not doing model checking and diagnostics. And then what they would do is they load the data and then they would just, uh, you know, uh, just uh, um, use the package to run the GE models and then get the output and then, then be done with it. I think that's that's really um, a dangerous approach, I think. So um, as you can see, so through this example, I wanted to show you that, you know, really uh, when I'm kind of teaching um, Bowser students, I always um, emphasize that, you know, the model fitting part, that part is actually, the easiest, uh, it should be the, the part where you spend the least time with. What you do before fitting the models and after fitting the models are more important uh, than the, the uh, actual model fitting step. Because you know before um, fitting the model, you want to make sure you do sufficient exploratory analysis. You know, as we did before, you know, explore the distributions of your data, uh, plot the trajectories and get some idea of what the rough trend that will guide you, you know, which, uh, which shape, which trajectories, which type of mean model would make the most sense, right? Uh, and then, um, then also like after fitting the model, now you also wanted to do uh, some model checking. Typically you can check the residues or you can check 
the fitted versus um, observed, like we know the observed trajectory versus the model fitted trajectory, as we have seen in previous slides, right? So that all will also give you a guidance of, you know, you assume that this type of shape, this type of model, uh, does, is that model, does that model really make sense? Or uh, is that consistent with the data, right? So I think that's, that part is really important. Uh, and then, uh, so, so you explore the data, then, you know, after you get a sense of trajectories, now you can build the mean model. Now for this part, you can ignore the correlations. Uh, and then it's also not like, you know, uh, having one model and be done. It's also like typically it would involve, you know, you have start with one model and then check how well it, it fits the data, right? It doesn't fit very well, then you maybe try to think of an alternative model or maybe add additional conjugate term or add like a plateau term or, you know, even consider non-parametric and then see that that improves the fit. And then you, you iterate through this process until you got a satisfactory fitting uh, of the model and also, it also includes, you know, which variables you should put into the model, right? So the model selection is also um, an issue here. And once you have a good idea of the mean model, uh, now you wanted to uh, explore the correlation structure. Um, so um, now, uh, as then you you will be able to fit GE. And the before fitting the GE, I typically would assume you kind of like I did in the previous slides, you know, you actually um, plot the data, just generate the based on the scatter plots, just to, um, calculate the uh, correlation matrix, uh, because that will give you a rough guide on which working correlation makes the most sense. Uh, now, it, with that, you'll be able to, you'll be ready to fit, um, use GE to fit those models. Uh, and you know, because we know GE is robust uh, in the sense that no matter which one you choose, you, you still get, you know, the correct answers. So, so you, you try to, uh, I, I typically recommend try to take advantage of this robustness, try to fit not just one, but maybe more than one, maybe two or three models. Um, now the reason for doing that is, you know, one thing, it give you sort of, you want to check, do you get the similar conclusions or different conclusions across different models, right? If it's a similar, it will be reassuring. If they are different, it will be a warning sign to, to maybe try to be more careful. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, if you compare these models, you will also be able to see how the standard errors compare from different working correlation structure, okay? Uh, and then you know that um, the, the better you are at uh, with guessing the right correlation structure, that's uh, typically you, the more efficient you will be. So, so, so in that case, that's why this step is important because from this step, if you already sort of have a, have a good sense of maybe let's say AR1 is more reasonable, then you probably put more weight into this AR1 model, or maybe in sort of in choosing which, which is your final model. Uh, now, finally, you know, you maybe also want to do some model checking as well, and then you make inferences or conclusions. So I guess the, the things I want to emphasize is like, you know, really uh, make sure you spend enough time to explore the data for uh, both uh, understanding the mean part as, as well as the correlation parts. Uh, as then after you got the model fading, you know, look at um, look at the models from you know it's different models and try to um, to understand if you you know if you, they are similar, oh, uh, then that's good. But if it's a, if it's different, why it's different? Make sure so that you understand uh, those because that might indicate you maybe something wrong uh, in the in the model specification. Sometimes if you found some weird results in the GE stack. Um, you may need to go back to the mean model. It's, it's also possible you didn't um, do a very good job of fitting the mean model. Um, yeah, so all I would say, you know, before fitting the data and uh, before fitting GE and after fitting GE, those make sure you spend a lot of time on those parts, make sure, you know, you sort of understand uh, the, the, the main concept. Um, I think, um, now I, can, I think I'll, we can, um, if there are any questions, feel, feel free to uh, send in the chat box, otherwise, uh, let's uh, take a break and uh, I'll continue after about 50 minutes. Sounds good. Thank you, Changzi. Sure. So, yeah, great. I think so. We'll, we'll, we'll restart at, I think, 1.45 then. Yeah.
Jag har gjort det så. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome back to the second part um, of this workshop. Um, so let's continue to the. Uh, I think in the first part we actually we just uh, um, reviewed uh, what is longitudinal data and uh, um, we just uh, uh, mostly you know give like a, a brief idea of you know how do we. How do you uh, fit the GE, um, especially for, and we give you an example, especially uh, using continuous data. I think in the second part, I would just, uh, um, I wanted to go um, through some, I wouldn't go through, you know, too much technical details, but I do want to spend some time to sort of, um, to explain a little bit. You know, uh, we, we said in the first part, we said there's some uh, nice properties of the GE methods, like, you know, it's valid, it's efficient, it's robust. So I don't want to, um, you know, using some toy example to give some a brief insight into why that's the case. Um, so hopefully it might help you understand. And then I will also um, illustrate using a um, example with binary data instead of continuous data. Um, so let's um, get started. So uh, I would maybe again start from this slide. So. Oh, uh, this slide is um is saying you know why not just ignore um association or ignore correlation um so now we suddenly evaluate uh what might happen that you know especially I just give you the conclusion that it will give you the um invalid um standard errors the standard errors are wrong and then you get the wrong confidence interval or wrong p values uh, but you still get um valid estimate of the regression coefficients. Um, but then the bad thing is you might not be using your data efficiently. You might throw away some information, right? So now I think here, um, I just wanted to, um, there will be some notations, but I, I will try to walk through um, a few toy examples. So hopefully, hopefully you get an um, idea of the concept about why, um, you know, exactly what, how does GE work and why it can solve the problems of this sort of typical um, regular regression. Now this is a standard um, GE where you specify mean regression model. Uh, now this is a form in we specify in the form of a generalized linear mixed models. Now for um, those of you who might not be familiar with this term, so it, it's really a, a family of models that contain linear models for continuous data that contains um, logistic regression for um, binary data and Poisson regression for uh, counts data. It's basically a really general family of models. Uh, for those models, you typically see specify the mean of the response is some function um, of covariate uh, and some parameters. Okay, this function is typically called a link function. I'll go that um, in the next slide in more details. And then you, you put the covariates here and the beta are the, your standard regression coefficients. Okay, so that's kind of the mean model part. As in the, we said for longitudinal model, it's also important for uh, the association. Whereas, you know, we I think the uh, first half we talk mostly about the correlation, uh, but it doesn't have to be correlations. Like if you have binary data, for example, you have binary data for visit one, visit two, and visit three. When you evaluate how you know data from different time points are associated, are correlated. Um, sometimes correlation might not be the best measure. Sometimes odds ratio might be a better measure. Right? You can also specify a model for odds ratios. Now in the association part, you typically um, involve some parameter alpha. Alpha typically maybe some sort of correlation or odds ratios. Now let's, uh, well, um, I think um, this version, um, there may be something wrong in this. Uh, let me see if I uh, try to open a different file. Uh, um, Mm, I, I don't think I, it's, it's not, I cannot find it that easily. So, so never mind. I think let's um, maybe still look at this, but I would just say it like, you know, when you're, um, you have uh, binary responses, 
right? So we typically build a logistic regression model. So we, because it's binary response, so we, we what we model is actually the probability you know, of the outcome y i z equals one, right? So the basically the proportion of ones in this response, the probability is our um outcome. So we wanted to model that as a function of some covariance. So typically we are doing a lot. Log, log logistic transformation, we are seeing you know, the log odds um, of y equals one is a linear function of, uh, of x, it's x i beta, something like that, right? Uh, so that's uh, that's really a special, I, I guess the point I want to make is like logistic regression is really a special form of this where you choose this edge to be a logistic, uh, logistic transformations. Um, and then, so, and then how does uh, how does exactly uh, does GE work? You now why it can uh, you know uh, take care of these correlations? Um, so now once you uh, specify those models, now the main idea is that um, it has um, you know uh, a few uh, basically it's just three steps. So the first step is like you choose uh, you estimate your coefficients beta uh, to make to to make the mean model predictions close to the observation. So like all any of the models that we fit, you know, typically is seeing that um, we try to make our predicted value, we choose parameters so that our predicted value is close to the observed value on average. So that's basically the essence of pretty much all um, statistical um, methods. Um, and then so for the regression coefficient, we still do that in the same way. Um, but then when there is correlation, now the changes compared to your standard regression is that we try to weight, give different weights to the repeated measures to take account for correlations. Now correlation is typically, you know, it can be in the form of unequal variance, it can also be in the form of a correlation between different observations. So that the key is here, you, you need to weight them differently. So I will just give you a tell example to, to show you exactly why. Um, and then the third part is, uh, you know, you wanted to, uh, you know, uh, estimate the correlation. What's the correlation, right? Again, the correlation parameter is alpha. So you choose them so that your model predicted correlation is close to your observed correlation. So I think that that's really, so I think the key part is really the second. So why do we need weight? And why why is weighting helpful? Um, let's just um, look at two um, very toy, uh, two toy examples. So hopefully it give you a good idea. So I'm again using a continuous uh, outcome where you have, let's say you have three observations, y1, y2, y3, and your model is seeing that, you know, um, every observation is coming from, um, you know, multivariate normal distribution uh, with beta zero as the mean, they have the same mean, so uh, all three components have the same mean, and the variance uh, is like have this covariance matrix, which is V. Now in, the, in this case, I'm taking the V to have this form. So basically Y1 has variance one, Y2 has variance one, but Y3 has variance 10. Okay, and then, but um, you know, between any pairs, the correlation is always zero. Okay, so this is saying that basically the three variables, they have uh, unequal variance. So the variance are different, especially, you know, Y3 uh, has much larger variance. Now I, I'm asking you to try to um, estimate the mean parameter, the mean is beta, right? Because all three binary variables have the same mean, beta zero. So I want you to estimate this. Uh, now, um, if you don't even need any fancy model to estimate the mean, right? So uh, naturally you would say, let's just calculate the average of between these three um, variables, right? This is also equivalent to you just fitting a model and find the least square estimator, okay? So that's exactly the same as your, as your average. Um, well, I think this probably should not appear here. Uh, but anyway, so th this is this right? Does this give you a right answer? Yes, it does. Um, because average is kind of always a good answer, regardless of this uh, call as a structure. We, you know, the average always gives you an estimate of the mean. But the, the question is, is this the best answer? Is this, can we? It, you know, in the best in the sense that is this the most precise answer? Can we use the data in different ways that can give us more precise answers? Now you might start thinking, um, well, possibly, right? So what? let's try to think a little bit more about what this variance means. 
variance is really the inverse of the precision, right? So what this tells us is that we y one and y two uh, are pretty uh, relatively more precise. Well, y three uh, is really not very precise. You have really um, large spread, you know, uh, from its mean, right? So you have basically two relatively precise measures and one so not so precise measures. Uh, as in, so in that case, if you take the average, as you can imagine, so pretty much the error term for this will be more dominating, right? Uh, so, so then how do we address this? I think maybe most of you have heard of uh, some, a lot of times kind of, a, we weight those observations differently. The weight is a, a inversely proportional to the variance. Or in other words, the weight is sort of proportional to the precision, right? So if you use that idea, um, so it's, it's that basic thing because this method is in, too in, it's not precise. So we just maybe give give the y three a small weight, uh, as in the weight is exactly proportional to the inverse of the variance. So it turns out if you run the calculation, it turns out that uh, in this particular case, you will give the uh, weight point four eight to y1 and 0.48 to y2, but only 0.04 to y3. So you, you're still using information from these three data points, right? But you're just giving them different ways. Again, you know, the more precise one, we give them higher weights, less precise gives them lower weights. Now doing this, because it's still a weighted average of these three observations, it's still giving you a good estimate for the mean. Um, now you can, when you look at the uh, the uh, precision, or, so what would be the that would be we are talking about the variance or the standard errors for different estimators, right? If you compare this uh, regular uh, least square or average simple average estimator versus this weighted average, um, you you will be able to verify that the variance or standard error uh, from this estimate is much smaller than the previous one. Uh, so I think so that's kind of a, giving you an idea of you know. If your data have unequal variance, now, so remember, we don't have correlations yet, right? If your data have unequal variance, weighting is a nice way um, to, 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 to get more precision, to be more efficient in statistical terms. Now, so let's look at a case that's more closer to the longitudinal data, which is you will have correlations um, between the observations. Okay, now we do as a uh, toy example with uh, three observations. Y1, Y2, and Y3. Um, and now again, they have the same mean. So we wanted to estimate this mean. But the uh, variance uh, covariance matrix now have this form. Now, what this tells us is that first we look at the diagonals so one, one, and one. So it tells us that Y1, Y2, and Y3, uh, all the observations have variance one. Okay, so they have the same precision. Uh, but when you look at the correlation between them, it shows that the correlation between y1 and y2 is 0.9, uh, but the y3 is not correlated with either y1 or y2. So this is a possibly from a longitudinal data where maybe very likely y1 and y2 are from the same subject. So they have a correlation of 0.9 between them. A y3 is a separate subject, so it's independent of y1 and y2, okay? So in this case, um, now, if you were to again to ignore the correlation, uh, you would, you know, go back to your uh, least square estimate or your simple average, right? Simply take the average between the three of them. That actually is still valid in the sense that you still uh, get a, uh, you, you still uh, estimate the right target, which is the mean uh, of those uh, variables. Uh, but the question is, how about the efficiency? I mean, can you? Uh, can you do better? Can you get you know more precise estimators, or more accurate estimators? So now it, it does not seem as straightforward as before, right? But we kind of try to borrow the similar idea. Remember previously, in this case, when we are doing weighting, uh, we noticed the weighting help us to reduce the variance, to make the estimator more precise, and our weight is the inverse. Uh, of the variance, right? So in this case, the variance, this diagonal is, this matrix is not a diagonal matrix anymore. 
but still we can define uh, inverse in the matrix form. I mean, this is a, the, the part where I hope you, all of you maybe have um, some basic familiarity with matrix. So uh, like a positive sum of definite matrix, typically like a correlation matrix, it has an inverse matrix. And so we can define an inverse. So if you, again, if you divide an inverse and then you use the inverse as your weight matrix, now what you actually get is something like this. It's pretty interesting that you, what you, if you have this particular case, what you get is the weight for y1 is 0.26. The weight for y2 is also 0.26. The weight for y3 is 0.48. Um, or you can write it in a different way, uh, putting it together, saying that, you know, it's basically, um, you can also consider first you take the average between y1 and y2, uh, and then you take a weighted average between this average and y3. And in the second step, the weight will be 0.5 to 0.2, roughly the same weight. Um, now, again, if you do the um, algebra, you can verify that if you run this weighting scheme, you use, again, use the inverse of the variance covariance matrix as a weight. Now you actually are able to get more precise estimate. Your variance will become smaller. Now, the, um, I think the, um, if if you guys want to get some intuition of why um, why this might work, I think it can um, from the efficiency. It, you talk about you know where the information come from, right? So when two variables have a high correlation, what does that mean? That means that there's a quite a bit of redundancy in information, right? So if y one and y two are um, so this have this high correlation, if I know that y one is really high. I have pretty high confidence to see without seeing the data to know that Y2 is also really high, right? So in that case, that also means that Y2 does not provide a lot of additional information on top of Y1. Okay, so that's, so in, so in this sense, so actually if you have a correlation between um, observations, you actually have redundancy in information. So that's why, um, you should weight those. So the y1 and y2, that's why y1 and y2, the, the, their weight should be somewhat smaller than y3. Why y3 is kind of a really independent from everybody else, right? So it's a, the information from this subject is totally independent, it's totally separate. So it's not affected by the correlation at all. So overall, so, so I think from this case, so I guess I, I'm hoping that the take home message from um, these two examples is that, you know, in the uh, longitudinal data, you have these correlations. Now, what this correlation does is that it somewhat, you know, reduces the information. So this, in this case, the, the information containing Y1, Y2 would be smaller than, um, let's see, if Y1, Y2 were independent, right? So the correlation reduces the amount of information you can have. Uh, so as a result, you should weigh them accordingly. So, so in this case, positive correlation, you actually give them a somewhat smaller weight. Okay, um, that makes sense. Okay, so so now let's just go to um, uh, the, you know, the how GE works. Again, this is a, contains a lot of details uh, and technical details, which I, I don't necessarily want to go over, but I just want to say that, uh, that we are, the, the development of GE is really building upon uh, generalized linear models. In generalized linear models like linear regression or logistic regression, uh, we have uh, methods like maximum likelihood or least square or with least square type of estimators. Uh, as in, uh, there's somebody uh, proposed um, a method called quasi likelihood. So GE is really trying to extend uh, this quasi likelihood approach to um, to the longitudinal data. Uh, now, this is a, the main formula for this. I guess I don't want to go to details, but just wanted to give you an idea of what this roughly means. Um, so, so that you, I think, you, uh, so that probably help you understand why GE have certain properties. Now, this equation looks like this. So, there are on the right hand side. This is a yi is your observed data from subject i. Okay, it is a vector because you have repeated measures. As the mu i is your predicted mean from your model, from your mean re, uh, re, uh, structure model. 
is typically a, prime, um, a function of your regression parameters, okay? So this is, well, this roughly speaking is your observed minus, um, minus predicted, right? So it's like the difference, the distance between observed and expected, uh, and, and you know, observed and predicted, or observed and predicted. So if you choose a good model, if your model uh, doing a good job, you want to make this distance uh, small right, on average, right? So that's essentially what this whole estimating equation is about. So it's like, I try to solve this equation. I try to find beta parameters to make some sort of the average distance between observed and predicted as small as possible. So I think that's kind of the, the essence. Uh, now, as I, I said before, now we have this uh, need to have some additional terms. We can uh, ignore about this DI, uh, it's a little tricky, but the VI, I think it's, a, it's a really important. The VI, what is VI? VI is exactly the variance covariance matrix. So uh, that depending on your working correlation, that also depending on the variance uh, of, of those uh, responses, um, uh, but also depending on your working correlation. Okay, so now as you can see, so if we, if you sort of um, ignore correlation, so what you are essentially doing is you sort of uh, maybe using some more like uh, identity matrix over here. So in that case, you sort of weigh every uh, measure uh, within the same subject equally. And then we basically weigh every response equally. But with a working correlation, now what you are doing is actually re-weighting those responses in your equation. Okay, now why, why are weighting? That's, uh, as you can see in the previous toy examples, weighting help you, you know, make sure you give the right amount of weight to the, to the amount of information from, you know, so you have to help you account for the fact that there's a redundancy in your information. Okay, so that's why um, this working correlation is really important. Um, but then on the other hand, um, now why this is also, um, we also said that, you know, you need this working correlation, but uh, it, in the end, if you if you give it the wrong working correlation, you still get the right answer. I think, again, the reason is, if you do the, um, if you use the wrong working correlation matrix, so, you are still trying to minimize the distance between the observed and predicted. So as that can still give you a good model fitting, but the only thing is the weighting was not optimal, right? So you did not, it's think, just thinking about the, uh, the taking the simple average, when what you actually should do is, you know, weigh them differently. Okay, so you give a different weighting, so it still give you the right answer, but not the efficient or not, not precise enough. Okay, so I think, so that's, you know, hopefully, although this sounds, uh, seems complicated, hopefully you, you can you know, still get some idea of why um, GE have the properties, um, like in, in terms of validity and efficiency. Um, I think uh, we have uh, gone through this before. Um, so this is talking about different working correlation structures. Um, this is giving you the formula for estimating these coefficients. You know, you are typically, you will use some statistical package. So you don't really uh, need that to know the, uh, the details here. Um, and yeah, and then uh, go, go to the um, next part is to go to the standard error or, or variance estimate. I think I already said this before, and then this applies not only for continuous outcome, but also for a uh, discrete outcome like binary or count outcome uh, that, um, is this a sandwich type of estimator? Um, is no when, when you we, when we calculate the uh, the variance, the property says you should use this type of sandwich estimators. Now, the what is model based estimator? The model based estimator is like only if you get the wrong, um, you get the right correlation, then this formula will simplify a little bit. So, you, so it's not sandwich anymore, it's only have one term, okay? Uh, but this, uh, in order to use the model base, you have to be really, really sure that you, you get the wrong, the right correlation. I think typically that's not the case. That's why I almost never uh, recommend this uh, model-based variance. But I think um, you need to remember is that when you face a model, you want to be careful, do not choose the wrong standard error estimator. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, and I think also like as we said before, the, the really what the correlation is doing is, is affect your weighting 
So, um, so waiting, uh, you still want to hope to choose this weight as close to your optimal as possible. In that case, you will get you know, more efficient or uh, smaller standard errors or higher power. Um, I think that's probably about it for this part. Um, any, um, any questions? Okay, if, um, if not, let's go to the, uh, the next uh, you know, few questions. I think that's basically uh, the part three is about how GE works. Um, the next part is you know, like, uh, what's, what software can I use? Um, well, pretty much, uh, I don't know um, about the audience who do, you know, what, what software do you guys typically use, but um, pretty much all major um, statistical packages you can find uh, implementations of a GE. Um, especially SAS, uh, SAS and R, I give some codes in the slides. Um, so, um, you know, what I think we, we went through this already. Let's, let me just give, uh, try to pull out the example again. So, uh, so no matter what you did, so like a few com uh, elements, like they are kind of really common. So you specify your data set and then, you specify your mean model, uh, and in terms of you put you know all the relative and predict, uh, relevant predictor here. This is also the part where you know if you wanted to use like a linear model versus a quadratic or versus a plateau model, you wanted to kind of make sure you put uh, you transform the data, the variables correctly and put in the right the ones you want to use, and then you specify the repeated measure structure. So to so basically tell the program which observations are from the same subjects as I used um, specify the uh, working uh, you know, correlation. In this case, it's independent. Um, now, I, I think uh, in the example, because I wanted to show you, you guys the difference between model-based standard errors and the empirical variance estimators. So I really uh, have this, this model as he, I ask the program to also uh, output model-based uh, standard errors. Um, as in, in R, like, um, there are a few packages. I think GE pack is the one I use the most. Um, so again, so you try to specify your formula. This is your mean model. And then you just run this uh, GE GMM function where you specify your, um, what, what the type of risk response you have. If you have continuous data, you will use family excursion. If you have binary data, the family will be binomial. Um, and this is really a type of data. And then you specify the um, repeated measure structure, the ID, and then the data input, input data, and then like your correlation structure. So um, it's, I think it's, for the most cases, it's pretty um, relatively straightforward. Um, I see one question here. So there's a question saying, when the correlation estimated in the data differs from the expected or theoretical correlation, is it preferable to use the observed correlation instead of a theoretical one? Would it be a risk of overfitting? Um, the answer is yes, there will be um, risk of overfitting. I think uh, what you're, you're seeing observed, using observed correlation, um, that's probably closest to, to like choosing an unstructured correlation, let's see. Um, I think that as I showed before in the example, so uh, especially if you have if you have a number of uh, um, repeated measures, if it is kind of a more than three or four, uh, I think the correlation matrix become big. So you need to uh, a large number of parameters. And also if some of the uh, correlation are closer to the boundary, like negative one or one, uh, so then you will want also run into numerical problem. So I think, yeah, uh, overfitting is a problem. And then like the GE, I think, uh, the working correlation, another uh, way of, uh, of using like a relatively simple working correlation is, is that so hopefully, uh, you know, that you, you, as you can see, exchangeable, you only have one parameter, right? Also regressive correlation, you also have one parameter. So typically it only uses one or two, a small number of parameters uh, to hopefully um, you know, pro provide an approximation of your co true correlation structure. So I think that's, that is definitely also a balance between your uh, uh, you know, model fitting versus your uh, parsimoniacy or uh, stability to the sense that if you 
if you go with the unstructured one, if you allow to be more flexible, you run the risk. Um, yeah, you run the risk of being, you know, I uh, mean, unstable and then like maybe also in inflation as well. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, we see this robustness property that, that tells us that, you know, hopefully we, we I think that, so, so that tells us in, in practice, you can try to run, you know, a few working correlations. It doesn't have to be really complicated, just maybe a, a few simple ones that would already give you um, pretty good, even though not necessarily the most optimal, but already very good uh, estimate. Yeah. Uh, so let's see, uh, let's go to uh, what is uh, this page, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, so I think we said this before. So basically depending on your, so in any program, what you need for the mean model would be which distribution, think about which distribution are your outcome. And uh, each distribution typically associated with a link function. So the uh, normal distribution typically is uh, um, so-called identity link, and you don't even have to specify in most of the programs. By normal, you have to maybe specify logic link, Poisson data is like uh, counts data, typically need to specify a log link because they are always positive. And then you put in the, you know, your predictive variables, and then you try to explore what relationship works the most. And for the association um, or correlation model, so, you know, again, as I said, you know, you just uh, try a few different models. And uh, um, in terms of a discrete data, especially binary data, um, I think I typically recommend to specify like the structure for all the ratios instead of correlations, uh, because peers and correlations have some, um, have some issues uh, for binary data. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sometimes you need over this version, this is especially relevant for if you are familiar with the counts outcome, Let's say person requires, and sometimes you need those uh, over dispersion parameters. Um, uh, now, I think we went through this example already, so let's go to the second example. Okay, so this example, I also took it from the um, that uh, textbook from um, Diego, um, Leon Ziegler, and Hagerty book. Um, so this is um, from a two by two crossover trial. Um, and then the, um, the cross, I think for people um, who might not be familiar with crossover trial. So basically you uh, recruit um, some study participants and you random, randomize them into two groups. Now uh, each of the, everybody will receive um, both treatment options A and B. Okay, in this case, A is an active drug, B is a placebo. Um, but they receive the treatment in different orders. So in the second, in the first group, um, people first receive treatment A, um, so some time period, and then there will be some washout period, um, and then uh, those people will, uh, will get treatment B in the second period. And then uh, subjects who were randomized into the second group, they got treatment B first, and then washout period, then go to treatment A. Okay, and in this case, the outcome is like a normal electrocardiogram reading. Um, and it was coded as binary indicator one and zeros. One means you have a normal ECG and zero means abnormal ECG. Okay, so, so now this is a clearly a, an example of a longitudinal data, right? Because everybody, um, you know, you have the response at two time points, right? And each time point also corresponding, even corresponding to different treatment, but still they might be uh, correlated because this person's um, personal characteristics. Uh, and then so we, now for binary data, so this is kind of to show you how the data look like. Now, because the data are binary, so you can summarize them into like a, a frequency tables. Let's see, among the people who are assigned the AB group, uh, so first got A and then sec, uh, then got B to this group. You have a response basically at two time points, right? Um, at time one and time two. So the, the possible responses are like you got one, one or zero, one or one, zero, zero, zero. There are only four possible uh, outcome pairs, right? So as then so you, you can get the frequency for, in this case, P 
people who got A, B, actually 22 of them responded one is, I, I think one means uh, normal, yeah. So got normal ECG at both time points. Uh, and the six of them got abnormal at both time points. And uh, uh, nobody got uh, um, got uh, abnormal at time one, but there are six people get abnormal uh, at time two. Um, so uh, as in similarly, you can summarize people uh, from the second group who, who receive treatment B first and then treatment A. Okay, and then you can generate, you know, in total they are like 34, uh, sample size 34 in group, the first group and 33 in the second group. Um, now you can also um, uh, summarize uh, by the percentage of normal reading, uh, you know, at each time period, uh, those are the uh, results here. Um, now those, in this trial, the scientific interest um, typically, uh, you know, one is, is there any treatment effects, right? So this is a, really a comparison between A and B. Now notice that this is a little bit different from um, a typical two-hour randomized trial. Um, this is a two, uh, um, yeah, this is a, a different from a two-hour randomized trial where you really compare two groups, right? Uh, but in this case, everybody experienced both treatment options. So, uh, so actually the model building was a little bit different. So we will see in the next slide. And now the other question is, uh, does the order matter? So it means meaning that you know, even everybody take um, both treatments. Uh, does, does that matter if you take A at period one versus period two? Um, now, similar to continuous um, response models, we still have these two steps. So first one is talking, thinking about mean model, what mean model do you want to use uh, to, to help you answer your scientific question. Uh, question two is, uh, you know, uh, what potential association model uh, you can use. Now let's look at the mean model first. So, so, so for everybody now, so in this data, that's because it's designed, so everybody really have two time points, right? And so the, the outcome now you have the um, response, of course, it's uh, uh, the ECG score, uh, zero or one. And then your covariate, now what do you have? So I think what we have is the two variable covariates are the most important. One is which treatment do you get, right? Um, and then the second is uh, which uh, time period, is this uh, time period one if, uh, or versus two? So we try to put both treatment and period into the model. Now there are uh, two possibilities. One possibility is maybe you only have many facts. In this case, uh, we coded P2 to be the dummy variable for period two. Um, so uh, yeah, so it equals one for period two and equals zero for period one. And we code A to be the uh, indicator for the active treatment. Okay, so um, now, so you, you can have the main facts model, right? Where in this case, you specify the log odds of getting a normal ECG at time j for subject i. So the log odds of this guy is equal to this linear function of both period and treatment, right? So your interpretation for your beta one is seeing that controlling for treatment. So like among people who get the same treatment, what would be uh, the, the the effects of period two versus period one. The meaning, you know, among people who got the same treatment, if if you get the treatment from period two versus one, do you see any difference, right? And if you want to interpret the beta two, that's the effect for treatment. That means, but you also control for period. That means, among all people, um, you know, in this in only among uh, people in, in, from the same period. Let's see period one. So do you see a difference um, in effect in the odds of getting a normal ECG rating comparing uh, people receiving two different treatments, right? So this is main treatment effect. This is the effect of a period. But then also, of course, you can also think about the potential um, interaction or effect modification, right? So in this case, you would have this main effects of, of, of the period and treatment, but also you would have the in the interaction term beta three. Um, so we wanted to, um, you know, before uh, before fitting the model, we probably 
um, I'm not quite sure if there is interaction or not. So we maybe just uh, try to fit both models and evaluate how they compare. So those are, you know, because uh, we don't have additional covariates here, this is a randomized trial, so we don't particularly worry about confounding. So we, the mean models are relatively simple, okay? Now let's go to the uh, association models. So you wanted to uh, to model, in this case, everybody have only two responses, right? So we have YI1 and YI2. So now the correlation matrix is relatively easy. You only have this basically for everybody is a correlation between those two responses, right? Um, so, so then that make our job of modeling working correlation also a lot easier because you know, if you, you can still think about working independent, assuming that no association between time points. And you can also think about exchangeable, meaning assuming a parameter alpha or, um, you know, correspond to the correlation between the two time points, right? And, and if you want to think about autoregressive or unstructured, actually in this case, because there are only two time points, these are um, become the same as exchangeable because you really only have this one correlation to think about. So autoregressive is the same as exchangeable, unstructured is the same as exchangeable. So you don't necessarily need to consider them. So you only need to consider two options, independent and exchangeable, okay? As, in, um, I, as I also mentioned before, since this is particularly for uh, binary data, binary response, so correlation is one measure of, uh, um, of association, but not necessarily the best. So another option is you try to model the odds ratio, um, basically between two responses from the same subject, maybe uh, using an alpha parameter to model that odds ratio. Um, okay. So I think I'll skip this part. So in terms of how to um, phase this uh, in um, SAS code, code, this is SAS code. I think the, you can probably tell it's really similar to the, uh, to the continuous case where you specify the mean model. The difference mainly here is in the distribution, uh, distribution here, you specify a binomial distribution. Use this option instead of a, the default is, I think, a Gaussian distribution. And the link function, you also use a logit to, to say that you wanted to estimate the log of the ratios. Um, so then everything else is pretty much similar as before. Um, and then you also have this, you need to specify the um, uh, exchangeable uh, working correlation structure. Uh, and in case, um, if you wanted to use odds ratio instead of a correlation, now you would change the type to like log OR. This, this means you want to use log odds ratios. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, let's look at, take a quick look at the results. Um, so here, um, there are, this, this is a result from, if you fit GE from four different models, okay? So on the left-hand side, these two columns, uh, if you use odds ratio as your as your like association measure, um, so you if we fit two models, one with interaction, one with main facts only, and then you estimate those all those regression coefficients, and then you also get estimate of the association uh, parameter. In this case, would be the odds ratio, right? The, now we ask, no matter which model you use, we actually estimate the odds ratio to be about three point five. So that's pretty strong, as indicated, pretty strong within subject correlation, okay? And then on the right-hand side, so you have correlations. Um, you, you use correlation as your uh, main measure of association, okay? And then you still fit two models, your interaction model and the main effects only. Uh, now you can see, again, you can see, you estimate this um, coefficients of standard errors for each model. And uh, obviously this model have additional interaction coefficients. And you are able to estimate the correlation between the two time points. In this case, it gives you about 0 0.6. That's so also um, pretty strong, also indicating pretty strong correlation. So I think, um, so that's, that's again like, um, uh, as if you want to ask, you know, uh, should I use odds ratio or correlation? I wouldn't necessarily say which one is right, which one is wrong. Um, um, I, you know, as you can see in this case, in most cases, the results from both. Um, both uh, models, you actually got pretty consistent results. Uh, but if you 
if I were to choose one, I would say I was I would definitely prefer all the ratios because all the ratio I think is just you know a better measure um bit, uh, for binary responses. You just need you only need to kind of interpret them accordingly. Um, okay, now so let's let's look at the um the regression coefficients. So the uh, regression coefficients um. So I, I think we we said um a, a couple of uh, we have uh, you know maybe two things we are in particularly interested in you know the main effects for treatment right treatment A versus B does A will have a stronger effect than, than B or and then we also have the period effect I mean does the order matter or not or is there interaction meaning that also you know tells you um if you want want to choose a final mode or do you want to choose uh, the one with interaction or without interaction right so if you Focus on these two columns for now. So first, let's maybe look at um, interactions. Okay, so interactions. So uh, from this G model feeding, so you get the um, coefficient for interactions is negative one. Uh, notice that the negative one is in the log odds ratio scale. Um, so in terms of the odds ratio, it's probably somewhere in the um, around point point four, I would say. Yeah. Um, and then, but the standard errors are really high, right? It's, it's almost as big as the point estimate. So definitely uh, not statistically significant. Um, so, um, and uh, where, then you, you can also look at the, um, you can also look at the, uh, the other coefficients. If you look at treatment, uh, let's see treatment effects um, in the, this model, if the model has no uh, main effects, so the estimated yield the effect would be 0.57 in the um in the odds ratio scale. So I mean, sorry, in the log odds ratio scale. So in the odds ratio scale, it's about 1.77. So the odds ratio is about 1.77. Uh, so it's almost two. So that means uh, if you look at the standard errors, standard errors actually it's smaller than a half of this point estimate. So it's definitely uh, statistically uh, significant. Um, so there's a strong evidence to suggest that treatment, there's a difference um, in effect of the treat two treatments, okay? Um, and then if you look at the effect of the period, now the point estimate from this model is negative 0.3, but then the error is really big. So it's not statistically significant. Okay, and then, um, if you look at this model, you notice the point estimates, the odds ratios are somewhat different. Um, but the significance, I think, I believe it, it's the significance will still hold. I mean, you still get significance here, but not significant here. Okay. As in, uh, you know, to in evaluating, do you need to um, do you need to include the interaction or not? So I think um, there are, you know, a, a rough. Um, we hear is that you know if you look at this model, um, the standard error is pretty big relative to the point estimate. So it doesn't seem to be this. Uh, this I, I don't see like a strong evidence of interaction. But I think if I were to um, do this analysis, I probably would maybe do a little explore this a little bit more as well. You know, maybe even um, uh, while some um, in um, when you are using GE, I think originally there was no like. Um, uh, criteria, information criteria like AIC or BIC, uh, those criteria to guide us uh, through model selection. But later on, there were some people who developed some of those measures. So I think, um, uh, you know, if you use R, I believe uh, it has uh, give you some measures. So you can also look at those measures by information criteria to sort of uh, how you guide um, the selection between interaction versus and not. Uh, but I think overall, it, it appears I don't see a strong evidence of interaction. So let's, um, we can maybe focus um, this model. Um, so like, you know, if we to, um, interpret those, I think we already said, so like the coefficients are in the log of the scale. So, but if you transform that ex uh, using exponential transformations, it looks like um, the odds of getting a normal ECG uh, almost two times as high, uh, or you know, more precisely, seventy-seven percent higher uh, when you are using the active drug versus the placebo. So that you know, indicate a strong treatment effects. Um, and then the 
uh, the other part, you know, is to, as yet, do you see any strong evidence of within subject associations? It appears, um, you know, then that's a question for your association part, right? So the odds ratio, we got, oh, we got 3.56. This is actually a log odds scale. Um, so when it transformed into odds ratio scale, you got the odds ratio was 35, very, very strong um, evidence of within subject um, association or correlation, right? And if you are using correlation scale, you still get somewhere like 0.6, 0.64, that's also uh, pretty high. So, so that also um, maybe give you an indication that if you were to uh, ignore the correlation and run your typical logistic regression, um, it will be problematic. You know, you'll get the wrong conclusions, the wrong standard errors, and all of those things. And also, um, you will be not as efficient as GE. Um, I think that's about it for this um, for this part. So I think I see one question from Chess asking about can the R package handle zero inflated or zero truncated data that you know. Um, this is a very good question. I think I have to double check. Um, so. Um, the the packages the G I mentioned before, like the GE or GE pack, I don't think the um they can handle zero inflations directly. Um, but I I'm pretty uh, confident there that there there will there are other packages maybe more specialized they are able to uh, handle this uh, correlation uh, with GEs. Yeah. So I think if I find out, I'll let you know um after the workshop. Yeah. Okay, so um, so maybe just a quick pause. Um, any other questions for this example? No. Okay. Um, I don't see uh, additional questions. So let's just maybe go to the um, last few things. Um, so this is a, um, also like questions of what should I do or read to get started. So I. I think obviously that depending on um, your current familiarity with GE, if you already have a good knowledge, uh, you probably don't need to read too much. But it, if not, I think you know um, you can you know uh, feel free to uh, look at some of the classical textbooks on longitudinal data. So this this one Digo um, et al. book, it's a classical book, and then this one um, is like I think has a more applied flavor. Uh, as in, you know, there are some papers and review papers. Uh, and also, like, if you do some search, um, like many uh, places, many universities, institutions, they often have like a lot of um, um, courses in longitudinal data or maybe the workshop or tutorials, uh, you know, some information on this. So I think you're able to probably be able to find a lot of um, helpful materials. Um, and uh, Oh, this is like, especially if you are using maybe SAS or R, they are, you know, putting some link here where you can find some uh, documentation on, on how to run this. This is for R packages. Um, I especially recommend GE pack. Um, that's what I use the most. It has some um, advanced features. You don't necessarily need them, but I think it's uh, was implemented pretty well. Um, there's some resources regarding of this package. Um, and the, I think the, the other thing is like it's really important to just give it a try. I mean, if you have your project, whether it's from a particular course or from your own research project, um, just to, uh, always, I would always say, you know, you don't necessarily need to know every aspect of GE. You just, you know, try to run the analysis and it'll actually help you um, understand the process. And it may be also um, through the process, you may also have more questions as in, you, you can, you know, look into different resources or ask uh, people if you have questions. So the last question, you know, is what are the alternatives? So like, you know, if you are doing longitudinal data analysis, uh, GE is one method uh, we said, but it's not the only method, right? So, um, and also this method is, uh, is not necessarily, I don't necessarily view if, um, have an opinion on is there a, a um, better or best method. I think there are different, a few different methods. Each have their pros and cons. So, um, so the first one, you know, if you sort of pretend the data are independent or ignore the correlation, this is not acceptable because 
most likely you will get wrong answers. So let's don't do that. Uh, but then you can try a few other things. You know, the one uh, simple approach I didn't mention, but I think in your project, it might make sense to do some sort of data reduction uh, in the sense that if you, let's say if you only have two time points or three time points, you may be able to just, uh, let's see, just uh, take the difference between time one, time two, right? And then regress the difference on your covariance. That's one way uh, to fit the data. And then you, you can also maybe, if you have more than two, you maybe, you can also fit a, like a, a linear, uh, a straight line of your observations and try to get the slope and using your slope um, to, um, to fit the regression models. Or you can maybe adjust for baseline, you know, taking your baseline value as a covariate uh, in your model. Uh, and uh, there are, you know, a few marginal model approaches. Marginal is, I think we talked about this, it's really about, about population average type of effects. So GE is really one, um, the most popular approach with for marginal models. Um, but that's not the only one. There's also other models called something like marginalized uh, multi-level models. I think um, developed especially by um, Patrick Hackerty, who is a professor um, at UW here. Um, so um, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, recommend them if you are not you know, uh, into uh, complicated methods. But I think for marginal model Z, I think would be, uh, typically it would be sufficient. Um, so, but sometimes, yeah, more interested in the so-called conditional or um, subject specific effects, meaning you really wanted to understand, you know, um, the effect of a treatment uh, for uh, between, you know, before and after treatment uh, for each subject as a subject level instead of a population average level. Uh, now, I would say, uh, I think some of you may already know, but like if you have a continuous response, those, um, population average or conditional effects, they are actually the same. So it doesn't matter uh, much with you use GE versus random effects models. But if you have like a um, discrete response, like a binary data, so the odds ratio you get from GE will be very different from the one you get from random effects model. And I think that's it. Both of them are correct. They just have different meanings. GE is saying that, you know, across uh, average across people, across subjects, you have this also ratio. But, uh, but random effects are seeing that uh, for each particular subject, you have this also ratio. So they have really different meanings. Uh, and then for conditional models, random effects models are the most popular. Um, but sometimes people also consider transition models. Uh, transition model is like you model your um, response at a time point J, conditional on the previous responses. So I think just I'll just mention this very briefly so that you know you have um um a a big uh, uh, like uh, an idea of the big picture in terms of uh, um if you in case you have a project you think about which model you want to use and I think I would see also another um another difference is how do you view this correlation so um you know GE models we we keep using the phrase working correlation. Now, working correlation also says that it doesn't have to be correct, right? If it's wrong, you can still uh, you can still get the, the do the right uh, con get the right conclusions. Uh, so, so in a way, it's treating the correlation as a, what we call nuisance parameter. Meaning, I'm really more focused on the beta on the regression coefficient. I I wanted to get some idea of what the correlation is, but it's really not my focus. I do not really necessarily want to do formal testing. For those correlations, um, and so that that and thus, you know, I don't care if it, it might be wrong a little bit, okay. But in the uh, random effects models, um, sometimes you may be um, uh, also interested in the uh, the correlation or the um, you know variance of the random effects. So I I think that's uh, another difference between the two approaches. Um, so finally, I guess you know. Just maybe a very quick part of the count. I think we we sort of already went through this already, but um, uh, but briefly, um, the advantage of the you know obviously it can account for the correlation it uh, um for longitudinal data and uh, it has weaker assumptions. So this is related to the um to the so-called robustness property. Uh, in the sense that um, you know I the the, the thing 
you in fitting the model, you need to specify the mean structure and the covariance structure, the correlation structure. Uh, but it's really mostly only requires a mean to be correct. If you get the wrong correlation, that's still fine. And then also it does not require the, the full distribution, just the mean and the covariance. The second one is uh, even if you guessed wrong the correlation, you still get good estimate. So that's another aspect of, of um, a robust being robust. Um, and the third one is like, you know, um, the, the quality of your working correlation determines the efficiency uh, or the precision or the power uh, uh, of your model. Okay, so if you wanted to hopefully to be as efficient, as powerful as possible, you try to, you know, spend a little bit more time on getting the working correlation as close uh, to the um, observed data as possible. Um, and then it's also computation easy and fast. Um, well, uh, then um, in, in terms of the cons, um, I think the first one is like, again, it's, it does not, you don't have a likelihood. So uh, sometimes you're lacking some goodness or fade estimators, um, but, uh, but I think that, how, is that everything has a pros and cons. I think that's, uh, it's not depending on how you view it. It doesn't have to be a, a cons. And then the second one is, uh, um, oh, this is about, you know, we get the standard errors. So I just, I want to also want to say that uh, for GE to work, you need um, the, for the, for the formula to work well, you need the sample size to be moderate or large. The sample size in this case is the number of subjects. Okay, so the typical, so you want to make sure you, like, the number of subjects is large enough. Um, and, you know, if you are thinking about some cases, let's see, um, if you're thinking about um, multi site let's see, multi, oh, I don't know. Um, if, you see, if you have a case where you only have a few subjects, let's say maybe you have a 10 to 20 subjects, but each subject has many observations. Um, in that case, actually the GE do not work well. well. So that I think that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, uh, the last thing is it does not provide you subject specific effects. Um, in order to get that, you really have to go to a random effects model. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, I see a question asking, is there a way to measure the efficiency? Um, yeah, the answer is yeah. The efficiency is measured basically by the, um, the standard errors, the variance, asymptotic variance or standard errors. So the smaller the, uh, the, the efficient, uh, you know, because we are, we typically, we, for, if we uh, want to consider two estimators, so the requirement we, we, for them is that they have to choose the right target, meaning they have to be both uh, consistent. If, if they get the same target, then we will compare their like variance or standard error. So that was, will show you how precise it is. Um, it, it's a, yeah. Um, so I think other issues, I don't think I, you know, we have time to uh, discuss those issues, but um, there, you know, there are uh, a few um, topics you may ask, you know, are there any model checking or selection uh, techniques? Um, now the answer is uh, yes, there are some methods where you can generate, get some residual plots to help you check your model. And then you have some sort of information criteria and the test, hypothesis testing procedures uh, to do model selections. Uh, and then for missing data, now missing data, um, um, this is a, I think, um, I just want to just say here that um, the GE, you need a pretty strong assumptions on missing data. So for people who are familiar with the missing data mechanisms, so um, they are, um, they are really, there's one strong assumption called missing completed at random. So it means which data are missing is completed at random you know, as, it, as it says, right? So they're not depending on any observed data. Um, so we, you really need that assumption for GE to work, uh, to, to get the correct answers. Um, you know, if you suspect that, you know, I think in a lot of cases, the dropout may be sort of somewhat informative. Um, so um, there are some ways uh, that people modify GE to relax this assumption to maybe um, allow a missing and random. So this is uh, an option if you, um, if you need. Uh, um, as an yeah, we talk about this marginal versus subject specific and time dependent covariance. This is like another uh, complicated um, um, issue. I think I, I wouldn't go in, um, into detail here, but also seeing that 
uh, in the statistical literature, there were some methods developed on different models and different ways to face the models uh, to handle this uh, time-dependent covariance issue yeah, within the GE framework. Um, with that, I think that will um, conclude. Um, the, I think that's the end of um, my slides. So I guess I'll just at this point just uh, ask, are there any other questions? I wondered, Changzi, if if you could reiterate. I think you said something about it at the beginning, um, about the random effects model, the proper infant inference with random effects. You really need to have the model right, and with GEE, it's a little less, it's a, little, a little more flexible. Yeah. And, but we always have missing data, or almost always have missing data. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so it like with you uh, it is a so it, if i don't trust my random effects model i want to use gee for whatever my treatment effect or for my fixed effects estimation but i have dropout and i have non random not not you know of informative attrition and dropout or missing data mm -hmm. what what I mean, what do you, what would one, what would you suggest? Do you uh, do imputation and then run GEE on imputed complete data sets? Do you do something else? What, what do you, what do you think? Oh, that's a, that's, that's a very good question. And uh, I think, I don't think there's like a um, easy answer. I think to me, um, the missing data, yeah, uh, I think I saw comments in pattern mixture, yeah. So like missing data is like a whole separate topic. It's a really um complicated topic. You know, you you have a missing data, you can have missing data issue for uh, random effects models. You have missing data issue for if you're using GE. Um, both have, I mean, both the, the situation were a little bit different in some sense as well. Like as, as I mentioned, you know, like the GE typically requires even stronger assumptions uh, on the missing data. Yeah, uh, but um, so I, 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 would, I would not, you know, if you, I would not use uh, that missing data to sort of uh, um, how to handle, handle missing data to guide your choice between GE versus random effects. I think the, uh, in both models, there are some ways to handle missing data as long as you do it properly. You know, like if you just uh, run the default option, you know, go to a package and run the, a simple GE or a simple linear mixed effects models, I think there will be issues uh, regardless, right? If you have missing data, it's especially important to missing, right? Uh, and um, yeah, I think for GE, I think I see, as I said, you know, I see modifications of GE um, with, with more like from the estimating equation point of view, you try to model the missing probability. A lot of times it's, you know, the missing probability, you know, at the first time point, and the conditional probability of missing at the second time point, the condition of the first, you know, is you kind of have a, a sequence of conditional probabilities. And so eventually you'll be able, able to get some sort of a weight, you know, uh, to use the inverse weight type of methods. And then the imputation, I honestly, I, I haven't looked um, in, uh, too much into how to use imputation with GE. My intuition is uh, that works, and I believe that there will be people who have already done this. I think I I believe there will be publication on this topic, and I I feel like it it should work. But I can you know double check after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but I, I think as I said, you know, like in, in terms of uh, random effects versus GE, it's really would be I would say mostly the interpretation. Like, do you really want this kind of a average population average effect versus like the so, um, subject specific effect? I think that. Maybe one of the main uh, reasons, and you know how robust uh, do you want your inference to be? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. I've been really interested in GE for a long time, and this was a great overview. Um, I'm wondering, have you do you have any experience, or do you know if it's possible to do like mediation models for these types of interventions to get at the mechanism a little bit that often you're interested in? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so so yeah, mediation, yeah. I again, it's not something 
I um, have been looking into very uh, closely, but I think for minimalist model, yeah, you can totally, uh, you know, if you have, especially if you have repeated measures, you can totally use kind of a similar uh, idea to, you know, to, to fit your mediation model, yeah. Are there, do you know if there's like packages or if the, the GPAC, for example, has a way to do this cleanly? Because I feel like with any multi-level model, the mediation gets really complex. Um, yeah, I think, um, I cannot think of this off the top of my head right now, but I think okay. I, I have used one package. I believe it can handle uh, like really like for media analysis. I believe it can handle like correlated data using GE. You know, I can try to find out and then maybe send the information uh, along afterwards. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, so I don't think that's, I don't see any other questions. So maybe the one last thing I would say is like, you know, uh, for me, I think it's a, it's a, um, this, I have, you know, given like tutorials or workshops on this topic before, but I think the audience in the past may be a little bit different from this one. I think in the past it's a, maybe more like, like uh, a mixture, maybe half of them are statisticians, half are non-statisticians. I probably tend to make this a little bit more technical. This audience, I, I still don't have a good idea, but I feel like maybe it's more uh, towards the applied side. Um, so yeah, so I think if you guys have, you know, after the workshop, feel free to give, you know, some feedbacks. There will be some surveys. I think feel free to give some feedbacks. I think either uh, Brian uh, and I, we were talking about uh, in the future, we might have, uh, you know, additional workshops on longitudinal analysis. Uh, very likely, for example, another one on uh, random effects models um, in, the, in the next year or so. So, you know, any sort of uh, um, feedbacks do you want to, do you feel like the, uh, today's version is that, you know, too um, difficult or too easy or too applied or too methodological, you know, any sort of a comment will be welcome. Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah. So Brian, do you have anything, anything no. else to add? No, thank you very much for, for doing this, Changzi. It was very nice. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Um, thank you I, all for coming. Yeah. Oh, there's a one more comment. Yeah. Uh, Scott, go ahead, please. I was just waving. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, Classic sorry, yeah. sign off. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, though. It was great. And thanks, Brian, for organizing. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Sure. Bye. Yeah, your feedback is welcome. Other suggestions for workshops, topics, et cetera, are, that's all welcome. So please feel free to send any feedback you want, any suggestions or thoughts. Okay, bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs>